podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Saturday, November 6, 2021. Yeah, I took last week off, but I'm back live. This is episode 1841. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Start your IT career today by getting educated and certified for the big companies looking for IT professionals right now. Visit itpro.tv slash twit for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription when you use the code twit30 at checkout. And by AT&T Active Armor. You spent the day staring at your phone waiting for that one call from the job, the hospital, the family, and then it finally rings and guess who it is? A robot. Don't let fraud calls disappoint you. AT&T makes your security a top priority, helping block fraud calls with AT&T Active Armor. It's not complicated. AT&T Active Armor, 24-7, proactive network security, fraud call blocking, and spam notifications to help stop threats at no extra charge. Compatible device and service required. Visit att.com slash activearmor for details. And by userway.org. Userway ensures your website is accessible, ADA compliant, and helps your business avoid accessibility-related lawsuits. The perfect way to showcase your brand's commitment to millions of people with disabilities. It's not only the right thing to do, it's also the law. Go to userway.org slash twit for 30% off Userway's AI-powered accessibility solution. Let me, let me put down the mezcal. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hey, hey, hey. How are you today? No, I'm not holding any mezcal. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I am just back from the Day of the Dead in Oaxaca. We had a wonderful time. Thank you for not asking. Uh, our show today covers all the latest technology stuff. Computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, lots of new laptops, lots of new phones. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number if you want to talk about high tech with me. And my friend Micah, who's here, Micah Sargent, uh, joining me as always from now on, right on a Saturday, you're going to be here. That is correct. You're well-dressed. Oh, thank you. You're, you're good-looking. <laughs> you're young. That's everything I'm not. So it's a perfect combination. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, Micah will help us with uh, the questions and everything. Uh, 8888-ASK-LEO, 888-827-5536. That's toll-free from anywhere in the U.S., uh, or Canada. Outside that area, you can still reach us, uh, but you got to use Skype or something like that. It'll let you call a phone number from the internet. Uh, website, which is important because uh, everything we I say, you know, we talk about on the show ends up there thanks to our scribe, James DeRuvo. That website is techguylabs.com. And I mention that because uh, you don't have to write anything down. If, uh, if you hear it on the show, you can just, uh, you can just, you can just go to the website. It's free. There's no sign up. You might think, oh, he's just trying to get more money out of me. No, I'm not actually trying to get any money out of you, like zero. Just go to, <laughs> it's free. No sign up. I don't even want your email address. Just go to techguylabs.com. It's provided as a service and paid for by our lovely sponsors. So there. Um, techguylabs.com, what else? I think that's, uh, um, that's all I need to really mention. I have some in hand, some new gear. Just before I left, uh, Apple delivered this uh, brand new M1. This is the M1 Pro 14-inch laptop. So I took that uh, on vacation and really enjoyed using it. It's kind of it's a very much the base model, which still costs two thousand dollars, but it only has sixteen gigs of RAM. It only has five twelve gigs of storage. Uh, it is the lower end uh, M1. Pro processor, which for my purposes, I think in every respect is more than adequate, is fine. Um, I did buy the, so that was 2000 and then uh, at the same time we purchased, uh, the company did for uh, review purposes and then use of our, by our, one of our editors, our, our head editor, the high end, <laughs> oh my 
geez, four thousand three hundred dollars worth. Uh, the M1 Max, the uh, with lots of two terabyte. We didn't get the eight terabyte drive, but two terabytes of storage, uh, sixty four gigs of RAM. I think right? Is that right? Yeah, yeah that's the Max. So. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was supposed to be here so I could show it to you mm. through the radio. I'm holding up right now the old, the 14-inch. But the 16-inch, I, I, I was going to show it to you through the radio. But Federal Express decided we don't exist. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even understand it. They, they said it's undeliverable. The address is wrong. Same address they've always delivered stuff to. I checked. It was the right address. Um, it must have been our regular guy because he knows us. He, you know, yeah, we he usually would've, don't have problems with that. I, I think we give them a phone number so they can contact us if they can't find us with no text no call uh they just returned it that's the odd thing how quickly they just decided to Boom, return that's it, it. I think one you, chance you know what i don't i don't want to besmirch fedex drivers it seems to be happening a little bit more than it used to and i think that he was just tired and he said you know there's four more deliveries but i'm just gonna go home and pretend i couldn't find them I don't know. I think a lot of people are. I got to tell you, I had somebody. <laughs> we're all tired. We're all tired. I had. They left all of our packages in this breezeway at the uh, apartment complex I live in. Instead of delivering them to the houses, like it's they too far to do. go. Yeah, we just put them right here. Just hundreds of packages yeah. from all these just different leave them people there. had to dig through them to find mine. Oh it was a nightmare. God. Anybody could have just. Well, and it's a four thousand dollar laptop. You know, I'm glad he didn't do that. Yes, exactly. At least he sent it back to Apple. I called Apple yesterday, and they said, "Well, it's too late. We're uh, we're going to just issue a refund." I said, "Oh." And then I looked, and the next, the soonest I can get uh, get this back is December twenty third. Oh man! <laughs> so I don't know. I guess I don't know what I'm going to do. I think I'll buy a Dell. Did the one for your nephew? That one got there. Oh, good. Which is weird. So I I did get one as a gift for my nephew, just graduated from college from the Rhode Island School of Design. He's doing a. I think it's a secret. It might be secret. I don't know. I was gonna go to RISD. He's yeah. RISD's a good yeah. school. He's doing Tom Brady's clothing line right now. He's designing that. And he's Incredible. and he just got a job for Baron et Baron, which is a big French design house. So he's doing a lot of design work. And so he needs a he needs and this is kind of the point of this conversation. He needs everything the M1 Max can throw at it. It's kind of mind-boggling GPU and processor. The one I got does is pretty much the same as that except that the fewer GPU cores. Right. And I'm not doing in Cinema 4D, designing rocket ships or Tom Brady's sweatshirts. I'm not take, you know, I'm not using it for a, for anything too demanding and certainly everything I've used it for including my I took a lot of photos and all the and I'm using a variety of applications including a, a very heavy application called Capture One and uh, work fine and fast and speedy. What's the screen like? Because I was curious with all the photos you took. Is it as oh, beautiful as you know? it's a pretty hoped? screen. It's pretty. It's, a, it's this new uh, micro, uh, or sorry, mini LED technology. You've, you might have seen it on the iPads Pro, but, um, oh, I love it. In fact, if you really want to show it off, and this is what apparently a lot of people do, are doing, is you go to YouTube and you play back some 4K HDR video. Some people are saying that crashes the computer. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I have not experienced that yet. I'm waiting. Apparently, there is a little flaw somewhere, a fly in the ointment. But uh, otherwise, it does look just gorgeous. Let's see. What should I play? Costa Rica in 4K at 60 frames? How about that? So I'm just going to play this back for you. I'll turn off the sound because I don't want to violate anybody's. Uh, this is 1440p at 60 frames in high dynamic range. Look at that on the radio. Isn't that <laughs> But Michael, you can see it. Oh you man, can... it looks like I'm right next to the yeah. sloth. Yeah, the sloth is very vivid. <laughs> <laughs> so that is a vivid sloth. <laughs> so yeah, it's a beautiful screen. Uh, although I'll be honest, I uh, I can't really, in most day-to-day -day use, I don't really notice a difference. Right. Uh, it is. It does run at 120 hertz, which is pretty cool. Oh, that frog. I thought it's gonna jump out it's at gonna you. It's gonna jump right out at you. Yeah, it's really. Uh, I, I'm very happy. Apple did something kind of funny. It repudiated, in some to some degree, repudiated uh, all the laptops it's produced since 2016 uh, by putting in a MagSafe adapter. Remember those? They used to have those before 2016. It put in an HDMI port. Remember those? They used to have those before 2016. And an SD card reader, which actually did come in handy because I was pulling the camera card out and putting it in there. 
Uh, so I didn't bring any dongles. Nice. In, in previous Dongle trips, I would have had a, I would have had a lot of bag of dongles. So good on you, Apple. They also got rid of the touch bar, which I always hated because uh, I kept hitting it by accident. Siri would say, "What? Huh?" <laughs> said, no, no, I'm not talking to you. They put a big full size row of function keys. Full size, not even a like mini function keys as some computers do. And they put a nice big escape key, which is Apple's. I think is Apple's way of saying to high-end pro users like uh, programmers and stuff. Okay, okay. Yes. <laughs> you win. <laughs> this is the concession book. You win. Thank you, Apple, for... Uh, it, you know, Apple doesn't seem like the kind of company that admits its mistakes, mm -hmm. right? Right. Some companies do. Um, Apple's not famous, I think, for that. But uh, in this case, um, I, th you know, they didn't say, oh, we made a mistake. But I think... They're kind of tacitly saying, oh, we made a mistake, and yeah, we're going to bring back all those things that you love so very much. So uh, I'm incredibly happy with it. It's a, and I got the low end, which I so-called $2,000 yeah. laptop. Hard low to say end. that's a low end. But um, I did get that, and I took it on a trip with me, and I really like it. Great battery life, which Apple, uh, these new chips are famous for. They're famous for really high-end performance at a, and good battery life. I saw Intel just announced its new uh, processor, the Alder Lake, and I saw a review said, well, the top of the line M1 Max iPad, uh, MacBook uh, isn't quite as fast as the desktop Alder Lake. It's like, well, <laughs> desktop. yeah, it's a laptop. So laptops are never quite as fast as the fastest desktops. Uh, I would, I would very much like to see what they do. Uh, well, we, well, I guess we'll find out next year. With the desktops, that's what that's all that's left in this transition for Apple from Intel to its own silicon. The iMac 32 inch, the Mac Mini high end, and the mighty Mac Pro. There's a sloth. They're very slow going up the tree. Yeah, they really take the you time. You don't even need six. Kind of like Apple getting frames. its silicon out the door. <laughs> it's gonna take us two years, they say. Uh, I can also talk about the Pixel 6. Took a lot of pictures. We'll do that uh, later on in the show. Rod Pyle is taking the day off. He's speaking to spacemen. So, uh, oh, that's that's tomorrow anyway. You don't care about that. I was going to say, who? Scott Wilkinson. Who? You don't even know who he is, do you? You know the Saturday crew. Scott Wilkinson coming up. Home theater guru. Uh, we'll also talk with Johnny Jett, our travel guy. I have some travel tales to tell. Yes, you do. <sighs> My first international flight in two years. Was it fun? It was easy peasy. Oh, good. Got the global entry. Did you have to do the app with the having people look at you while you took your tests, or how did that go? Yeah, it was so easy. No. We got in. It was Maybe it's because it was late. Uh, got in. They go, hey, welcome back. You're in. Do you got anything more than 1600 bucks worth of souvenirs? No. Okay, you're in. Wow. That's good. I didn't mention these uh, very fine <laughs> Those mezcal $3,000 mezcal cups. No, we did. We, <laughs> we didn't spend more than 1600 bucks. Um, so don't worry, okay? Don't come a-calling. <laughs> you hear that? We didn't. I didn't. No. <laughs> I swear. No, sir. Uh-uh. Very nice guy. And then I said, well, actually, uh, we would like to get our global entry interview. And he said, oh. And he actually took us over. He said, come with me. So said, don't you have other people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come with me. So we walked over uh, and got our global entry. And that's kind of the third degree, but we got that. That means nothing because I noticed that the people who got in who didn't have global entry were going whizzing through. The global entry people had to go up to the camera, take a picture, oh. do all this stuff. <laughs> I've never been out of the country, so I don't know what it's normally like. Wait a minute. Whenever never? You, never. Okay, I'm taking to Mexico next time. <laughs> so uh, I don't anyway. know what it's like. So I, that's faster than normal? It was Yeah, supposed to be. Got it. Johnny Jett will uh, join us uh, in the second hour and the third hour. Of course, the Giz Whiz. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Your calls next. Stomp. Why is this going on? Has this been going on the whole time I've been gone? <laughs> the whole time I've been gone, we've been playing uh, Valheim. Is that what happened? I want to make sure you have a stream. <laughs> That's hysterical. All right, you want photos? Photo time. I should do all of the Pixel Six photos because those I'm are the curious. ones. Those are the ones that are most. Oh look, it's a pumpkin. You could take the pumpkin down uh, now, Kim. It's ah! Hall ah! <laughs> Halloween is <Pumpkin>. is over. <laughs> ah! I like the pumpkin. 
For the next three hours, Leo will bore you with trip details along with boring pics, just like your old uncle's slideshow. It's exactly right. In fact, I feel terrible for my family and friends because <laughs> I called and I've been talking to all of them, you know, it was bit by bit. And said, oh, can I show you my pictures? And this is even worse because what I do is I hold up the phone. Yeah, was... <laughs> it's terrible. Terrible. I'm sorry. You're right. I am your old uncle. Let me show you, though, a couple of Pixel 6 late-night shots. How about that? Because that is germane, not to me in my pic, in my, but this is the uh, night, night site. So this is a cemetery, uh, the Zapoteca Cemetery we went to during the Day of the Dead. And there's candles inside. There's entirely lit by candles and maybe some distant... Um, well, that's Okay, so that's the RAW. So that's one of the things that's interesting. It shoots JPEG plus RAW. So the JPEG is corrected there. And that's the raw with all the data, I guess, that you could then moder modify as you wish. Okay, that's incredible. That's the, that's the raw. That's the JPEG. Actually, it's good to have both because it kind of gives you an idea. It was really dark. You know, I mean, it, it, um, there's a little blue cast. I think that might be from the... There was a fluorescent light at the distance. Again, the, the raw. Oh, this is a movie. So that's why it's... This is kind of really what it looks like. Yeah, it's much darker. It's really dark. Than it yeah. Those yeah, the so the Pixel Six Night Sight's good, but there are, and, and Ant uh, Pruitt brought this up, and I think he's right. It does a lot of manipulation, and so maybe overprocessed. Some of it's a little overprocessed, but here's another. This is a completely dark shot. This guy. <laughs> this was. <laughs> this guy had a headdress that was a bull. You could see the bull. He was wearing it. But it had this weird scaffolding. I thought, what's the scaff what's with the scaffolding? And then he sets it on fire and it explodes. <laughs> and he's dancing around. I think I might have a video. He's dancing around, yeah. <laughs> with this thing exploding. And this band is playing. And fire and fireworks are going off. <laughs> it's very fun. A uh, little dangerous. I think they don't have the same kind of lawsuit pro problems in Mexico. Oh, yeah, that's quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> that number is not the number to call. 8880. We got to make a new song. 8888 Ask Leo. Kim Schaffer is the person who'll pick up that phone. Hi, Kim. Welcome back. Eight six seven five three zero. Oh, it's good to see you. You too. Uh, <laughs> you had a week off. I did, and you know what? What? I didn't do anything because I don't know what to do with myself I when I have free time I know. on the weekend. You just sit for three hours <laughs> each day, Saturday and Sunday, and, and answer the I'm pretend so to answer lost. the phone. So hello. I went to a soggy pumpkin patch, but that's good. Yeah, yeah I hear it rained a little bit while I was gone. A little bit, yeah. but the brunt of the rain was when we were here last. We're gonna get some more. <laughs> get some more soon. That was a day. Who should I uh, begin this uh, begin with? Let's go to Anthony in Lakewood, California. I think he wants to talk about old tech. Oh, I like old tech because <laughs> I'm an old guy. Anthony in Lakewood, California. Hello, Anthony. Thank you, Kim. Good morning, Mr. Laporte. Thank you for taking my call this morning. Thank you, Mr. Anthony. What's up? So, um, I'm an IT guy. I work with small companies. And I have a, I've had a project on the side for the last five years under the Knights of Columbus where I take people's old computers. I clean them up. I fix them up. And I give them to people that can't afford Isn't that awesome? Good for you. That's a great project. But I'm... I'm at a quandary at this point. I have several old computers, and I mean old. They're Dell Vostro 200. <laughs> oh, I haven't, there's a name I haven't heard in a while. Vostro. Cap capable of running, win they're licensed to run Windows XP yeah, only. Yeah, yeah. So I could put four gigabytes of RAM in the machine, and I could put Windows XP back on the machine and give it to a family with a monitor and a keyboard and a mouse, but the problem becomes that the browser is yeah. the real limiting factor yeah. here. Nobody's updating their browsers for XP. That's and what right. you're immediately going to find is, uh, in fact, XP users are experiencing this now, is that you can't visit sites because they say, well, you need a newer browser, but you can't get one. Exactly. So my, therein lies my quandary. I really hate to waste things. 
and and the need out there is so great yes for 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 computers because there are people that really cannot afford a basic computer and so what i would like to know is what would be your recommendation would your recommendation be to scrap these machines for parts no to, no. to deploy some sort of linux on it and if so what yeah so this is going to this is a little controversial my uh, certainly that is a very good use for Linux, is on hardware that can no longer support modern operating systems. Linux, because it's free, it's open source, it's not run by a commercial enterprise, and there's a lot of enthusiasts pitching in, uh, often we're run on low and slow hardware that just really won't run the commercial operating systems. Uh, there's Linux is like, forgive my French, the dam one called Damn Small Linux and Puppy Linux, and uh, X Ubuntu that are all designed for older hardware. And that's probably the number one thing people do with this old stuff. You could put more RAM in, and you probably know this, you could buy Windows 10. You might even be able to upgrade to Windows 10 um, for free if you could... I don't know, how would you do that? Because you need to have Windows 7 to get to 10. Exactly, and, and the issue becomes... I'm doing this on no budget. Yeah, I, so you can't spend the 90 bucks to upgrade. At, yeah. at some point, you know, $90 here, $90 there, it gets to be real money. Yeah, uh, of course. Right. And so the question is, you're going to get, this is where you're going to get pushback uh, from people who say, no, what? Linux? What's that? I don't understand it. But honestly, you could, if you spend a little bit t uh, of time, you can get a Linux that is locked down, safe, easy to use, and pretty com pretty comfortable for people who either haven't used computers ever before. It isn't, I think, see, there's a perception that oh, there's a geeky operating system, but I don't think so. So you're going to want a 32-bit version, obviously, because right. that computer's old enough. So, there are, so that's the first thing to look for is 32-bit Linuxes, and there are quite a few of these specifically designed for older hardware. You know, Ubuntu or X Ubuntu, which is more lightweight, would be good. And then what I would suggest is that you spend some time customizing it, locking it down, making it f easy to use. You can take that setup and, and put it on all the machines. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Thank you, Leo. It's a great, yeah, I'm sorry, I had to take a break, but uh, I'm still on. It's a great project. Uh, good for you. It, you know, it's, I've had people cry. In, yeah. in, in front of me when they get a computer. I, I've been doing this for the last six years, and I started with XP, and now I'm pretty much Windows 7, Windows 10 only because that's really where it's at. Um, yeah, I'm kind of of the, <laughs> I'm, I'm a renegade in this, but of the opinion that uh, novice users shouldn't be using Windows anyway. It's just so risky. The other possible thing you can do is put Chrome OS on it. Yeah, and and Google bought the company that uh, was making these Chrome uh, OS installs. It's an open source operating system. It is Linux. It's really what it is. Is it's a tailored Linux that's really just running Chrome. So you can, you might try. It just it's going to depend on somewhat on the hardware. I think you mm -hmm. are probably going to have to put some more RAM on it. Um, I'm not sure what the minimums are. Well, the, the the maximum these machines will support is four four gig of RAM. They have four four DIMM slots, uh, DDR. -2. Yeah, four would be enough. There's lots of Chromebooks today that ship with four. So go to Neverware.com. Neverware.com. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think Google bought them, uh, and they make something called Cloud Ready, which basically is Chrome OS to to install on any computer. But. Okay. Uh, you know, I've had issues with some PCs, so it's that would be my f like my first choice. First of all, easy for you, much more locked down and secure, uh, and easier for your end users because it's just a browser basically. But if you can't failing that, you can certainly put Linux on there. You just have to put some time into making it as locked down and, and easy to use. And I and I do appreciate that. My my hesitancy with going to Linux until I talked with you was. The kids go to school today, and they have Windows computers. And then they come home, and... A lot of kids go to school and have Chromebooks. <laughs> okay. Far more than have Windows, actually. And uh, most... It depends, of course, on the school. But I think a teacher would not expect the kid to have uh, software like Microsoft Office. They might. 
Uh, but then there's a web-based version of Office, right? So if they say you have to use PowerPoint, uh, there's a web free web-based version of PowerPoint. There's free Office software. Yes, and I give them LibreOffice. As yeah, there you go. The, you the see? Install. You see? You're already halfway there. Sir, thank you. So hey, thank you for what you do. I think that's really great, Anthony. You have a wonderful day, and maybe I'll give a call back and let you know what happens. Please do. I think everybody would like to know. Have a wonderful day, sir. Thank you. You too. Goodbye. Bye. Hello, Scotty. Leo. How are you, sir? Doing good. How about you? I'm great. I'm great. Man, that, that trip sounds like it was amazing. Oh, you would uh, I know you've been, uh, have you been to Oaxaca? No, no. I know you've been to Mexico. I've been to Mexico. Yeah. I have, yeah. So Several Oaxaca's times. the food capital of Mexico now. Oh, man. And uh, we ate the whole, like many meals. <laughs> uh, it also is the mezcal capital. And as you know, I'm not a huge drinker, so I did some mezcal tastings, but I wasn't I wasn't going to drink a lot of mezcal. You like mezcal, though, Micah. I, I do. Yeah. yeah. Oh, do you as well, Scott? Oh, yeah. Really? Well, let me go get sure. some. <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> I just happen to have a little bit of mezcal. Would, would that I could be there. Yeah, I'm not a big uh, not a big drinker, but uh, when I do I'm have a either. beverage, uh, typically if, it, if there's a mezcal-based drink, I just saw one that uses carrot juice, mezcal, and a few other things, and I thought, that is my dream. <laughs> I wow. have to. I, there's some stuff in it that uh, I had to, you know, go and find and source, so I haven't been able to make it yet, but I have I a feeling that's going to be my drink. Mezcal and carrot juice? Yeah, like a nice smoked oh. carrot flavor with some spices mm. in there. It'll almost be like a, a smoked pumpkin pie is how I'm feeling. Yeah, thinking. yeah, wow. Yeah. I'll try that. Yeah, right? Doesn't that sound good? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Tekai uh, program brought to you this week by IT Pro TV. This week and every week, frankly, for years. We're big fans of IT Pro TV. I was there at the beginning, I'm happy to say. When uh, Tim Broom and Don Pizzette, uh they actually came to an event uh, we did at NAB talking about live streaming. Um, I can't remember who was on that panel. I think Adam Carolla was on the panel with me. Anyway, it was a fun event. And these guys, D Tim and Don, were already IT trainers, you know, in the classrooms, traditional classroom setting. And they saw us talking about, you know, streaming, podcasting stuff. And they said, you know, be interesting to do IT training kind of like Leo does Twit TV as a internet TV station. And IT Pro TV was born. Now, of course, it completely surpassed us. They have their own studios in Gainesville, seven of them, running Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, always creating new content with their enthusiastic edutainers. That's what they call them uh, because they're experts in the field. Of course, that's, that's first and foremost. Uh, but they're also really good at communicating this information. So they're edutainers, and they and they love IT. You will love IT. There's and because they have all these um, studios, the, the content is always up to date. It has to be. New versions come out. Certifications change. Uh, Microsoft just dropped the MCSE, so there's all new certifications for Microsoft, for instance. But the beauty of IT Pro TV is everything is always up to date. The exams change, the certs change, the content changes, new versions come out. They're ready, constantly producing new content. 5,800 hours of content. And, of course, it goes from studio to library in 24 hours, so it is fast. They always divide everything up, I love this too, into 20 to 30-minute chunks. So it's a perfect thing to digest a little bit during your lunch break or, you know, when you got a moment here and there. A great way to learn about IT if you want to get into the field, if you're not in IT now, but you need the cert to get that first job, or if you're already in the field and you want to get recertified or learn new skills, there's no better place to do it. They've also got transcripts, so you don't even have to watch an episode if you want to know just one thing. How do I set up this Windows server? You can jump right to it. Search in the transcript and jump right to it. This month, they've been doing monthly things, which is great. It's AWS month at IT Pro TV. Uh, coming up November 13th and 14th, next weekend, is free. It's free. Three free AWS courses available to free members. So what a great way to get to know IT Pro TV. They've got new AWS uh, videos on their IT Pro TV YouTube channel, which, of course, you can see for yourself. Uh, they're also going to have guests from AWS on their IT Pro TV podcast on Pazette does that um, Technado. So 
that is something to pay attention to. Next weekend, free weekend, November 18th at 2 p.m., there's a webinar on cloud data protect on AWS, and that'll be with AWS's senior security consultant, Tracy Pierce. So what a great way to learn from somebody who really knows. This is what I love about IT Pro TV. They've got the great teachers, the edutainers. They've got great classes, always up to date. They're always doing special events in these webinars. The YouTube channel, the podcast. It's just a wealth of information, and it's a community that you will love being a part of. Start your IT career today by getting educated and certified for the big companies looking for IT professionals now. It couldn't be a better time. Huge demand for IT professionals, and the pay is great, by the way. Visit itpro.tv slash twit. Right now, we've got a, a discount for you, 30% off all consumer subscriptions. As long as you stay active, it's 30% off. That could be forever. The offer code TWIT30, TWIT30, 30% off TWIT30, get it? ITPro.tv slash TWIT, 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription with the offer code TWIT30. ITPro.tv, build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey with those great guys and gals at ITPro.tv. We thank them so much for supporting the Tech Guys show. And uh, thank you for supporting it by using that uh, special address, itpro.tv slash twit, and the offer code twit30. Now, let's get back to the tech guy. What is hip? Mr. Scott Wilkinson, that's who's hip. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. and Canada. Scott joins us every week to talk about home theater. And I give out you the bet. phone number because if you have a home theater question, Scott usually sticks around. For the rest oh, of the hour, bet. so okay. we can always take uh, some home theater questions as well. What what what's what's up in your world, Scott? Hey, well, I just posted a review. I've actually got a couple reviews I'd love to talk about. The first yes. one is I just posted it yesterday. Uh, you're familiar with a speaker company called Audio Engine. Yes, I, I love audio. I've recommended them as computer speakers. I think they're that's exactly right. Well, this is this is what I just reviewed was a pair of Audio Engine computer speakers called the HD3. What makes them now, computer reason, speakers is they have built-in amplifiers. So all you have to do is connect it to the output of your computer and they, they'll they take care of the rest. Well, that's true. Now, most Bluetooth speakers, uh, not only computer speakers, have a built-in amplifier. They're what are called active speakers. Active. Okay. That's right. a good word. These are intended really for computers because, A, they're very small. Yeah. In fact, they're smaller than most, and that's why I wanted to review them. My wife actually needed a pair of little computer monitors to go by her computer, but the space was limited. They look like they're so about I, the size of a coffee cup. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> a little bigger than that. A little that. bigger, yeah. You know, but the, the woofers, the, the, the low-frequency drivers in these two-way speakers are only 2.75 inches, so they're very small. They do have a slot, what's called a slot port in the front. So the ported cabinet actually allows the bass response to be a little smoother. They, the specs claim that they go down to 65 hertz, which certainly isn't, isn't subwoofer territory, but it's pretty respectable for such tiny speakers. You can add a subwoofer. So my main and system you can. Uh, at home with the big 55-inch OLED display has mm -hmm. two audio engines, roughly the same size. They're earlier. They're more vintage. They don't have Bluetooth or anything. And then right. underneath the desk... I have an audio engine subwoofer, and you know, uh, and that really makes yes. a very, I think, a very full sound. I think they sound excellent. It absolutely They're does. Very accurate. I, I'm, I'm waiting to he, to to get a subwoofer to put with these. Yeah. Uh, I, I I I reviewed them just by themselves, and by themselves, they make a super clean, super clear, very transparent sound quality. I really really liked it. The only thing that was missing was a, a little bit in the bass. Yeah. So adding a subwoofer to that, and, and Audio Engine makes some nice little subwoofers that uh, should should do should fit the bill but perfectly. But if it's your under your desk, you can make it big if you want. <laughs> I mean, well, you can. Yeah, you can. I rest sure. my feet on it. <laughs> <laughs> it can it can really rumble the desk, which is which is great. Um, yeah. So I exactly. think they sound very very good. I've been a fan oh, of Audio yeah. Engine. Oh yeah, these these sound really good too. No, these uh, have Bluetooth, and, uh, which mine don't. So they've added, that's something they've added right. now. Yeah. Right. And the other thing that's important for computer speakers is having a USB input. 
that lets you connect a USB output from your computer. So they have a built-in, what we call a DAC, digital to analog converter. Correct. Oh, that's mm -hmm. interesting. That's unusual. A lot of these speakers expect you to have the DAC built into the computer, you use the computer's DAC. Often those aren't very good. Uh, this one has its own. Is it a, is it a good DAC? And it's a, really, it's a really good DAC, although it is somewhat limited. The DAC itself is made by Texas Instruments, and it has capabilities that go, you know, in terms of uh, audio resolution, goes way over what anybody would need. TI makes some really good uh, Oh, really good chips. Yeah. So the, yeah, absolutely. Just for people who aren't, who say, what's a DAC? The, the computer obviously is in ones and zeros. It's a, it's a digital it's a device. Di yeah, digital. Speakers the audio need, that comes out of it, yeah. Yeah, speakers need analog. They need, you know, waves. Correct. Kind of like on an old record player, they just need analog. Right. So something right. has to convert those bits to analog. And the better the quality uh, of the converter, the better the sound's going to be. Also, some converters yeah. can handle high-res audio, some of the fancier right. Th This formats. converter can do that. It can ha theoretically handle high-res audio, but the implementation in these speakers does not. And I found that rather interesting, and, and I asked Audio Engine about it, and they said, well, it was the engineering implementation. We, we crammed so much into this thing with Bluetooth uh, and USB. It's, and all, It's all a all lot for stuff. little speakers. Yeah, It is. It yeah. is. They said we, we needed to c c compromise somewhere, and what we did was we compromised on high-res audio, um, which I don't find to be a problem. Well, that's a compromise uh, not on size but on price, right? Correct. How much correct. are these? Three hundred and fifty bucks for the pair, for the pair. So that's expensive for computer speakers. I mean, people can it is. get computer speakers for fifty bucks. But, yeah, but they yeah. sound a lot. But better. if you want good sound quality, yeah. I love <laughs> the it that they also provide a picture of you of you using these little teeny weeny speakers <laughs> in your stereo. Yeah, uh, on on stands they do sell them. They do sell these stands. Yeah. And again, if you added a a subwoofer, it wouldn't be awful. It wouldn't be awful, but. Yeah. I, I maintain that these are meant to be listened to in in what's called the near field. That yeah. is close to them. They're better for computers. You know, you're sitting at your yeah. computer. You've yeah. got these computers, these yeah. speakers sitting right there. Um, the other reason I don't mind it not being high-res audio is it's sitting next to a computer, and most computers have fans in them. Right. So there's a noise right. floor that you're not going to hear high-res audio. High res dynamic That's range. That's probably anyway. true. Yeah. You know. So anyway, it, something it to be aware matter. of. And you could use a separate DAC if you wanted to, like our our you friend could. the uh, iFi. Um, yes, the iFi Hip DAC. Hip DAC, which I I yeah. really like. That's another ninety five oh, bucks. Oh, I do books. too. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, you said you had two reviews. You got a couple minutes left. What else did you want to talk about? Oh, uh, I've got a review. It's a couple year, couple weeks old. <laughs> a couple years. Couple weeks old. Uh, it's the JVC XP EXT one called the Exofield Theater. Is this also we, on TechHive.com? It is. It is. Yeah, I sent you a, a link to it in your email. I don't know if you can grab that real quick, but um, it's basically a headphone virtualization system. And what that means is if you feed it, it, it comes with a pair of wireless headphones, which is cool, wireless, and a little processor box. And you plug HDMI into the processor box. And if you feed it, say, a Dolby Atmos soundtrack from a Blu-ray or an Ultra HD Blu-ray, it will recreate the effect of listening to that soundtrack with speakers out in your room. It takes the sound from headphones and puts it outside your head. Wow. Is that where you uh, want the sound to be? <laughs> I'm just asking for a friend. Yeah, 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 you do, actually. Okay. You hear I mean, when you're, when you're listening to headphones normally, yeah. everything you hear, it sounds like it's inside your head. It doesn't sound like it's coming from speakers out in the room. Uh, this attempts to make it sound that way. See, I'm kind and of... I, I'm changing my tune. You know, Apple's really pushing this also, this spatial, spatial audio. audio. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that kind of what you're talking about? Is it like yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. Sony 360 Reality Audio is the same sort of thing. So uh, there you Dolby Headphone is the same, same sort thing. of thing. Yeah, Dolby Atmos is what uh, Apple's using. And while I love it for theater, because you have objects moving around behind you mm -hmm. and above you and mm -hmm. so forth. So in a movie, yeah. it's great. I don't know if I really want cellos above me. <laughs> or flutes behind me. Most of the time when I'm listening to music, it's kind of, you know, in front of me, like a proscenium. That's true. That's and true. so and I, I feel listen. like it, it's spatial is a little bit of a gimmick. It's well, not what you're going to hear if you go to a concert. 
Well, no, but it depends on the source material. I listen to some uh, records or some CDs, DVD audios from AIX Records, which mixes they do great five stuff. point. Yeah. They do really great stuff, yeah. uh, and and it mixes a five point one music with it with what's called the audience perspective. So you're in the audience, the music's in front of you. So you think it's okay. It's okay. This this implementation is not the best I've heard. It's a little gimmicky to me. Anyway, and we got to take a and break. And it's expensive. Scott Wilkinson, Home Theater Geek. Find him at techhive.com. So what I then do is I put Scott into our chat interface and I bring the clock in over here like this. <laughs> and so uh, that and the is, clock is so three appreciated. and five on the switcher. And there you go. Boom. Boom. Yeah, somebody uh, took the... Uh, <laughs> took your mezcal? Yeah, well, Whoa. I'm sure they drank it. I doubt, what? I doubt they just borrowed it. But I have others at home. Um, and I did get... Did you get a little bottle? I got a little bottle. So that's not really meant for... That's meant for drinking in like these shot glasses, not for meant for drinking in... Uh, in cocktails, in mixed cocktails. Drink. I mean, at least that's how Lisa prefers it. In fact, so do I. Because um, it's just, just it's just strong. Shots. But we did a lot of tastings where they teach you how to. Oh, see, the, understand I'd love to do that. Because I've had a, a mezcal flight before. Yeah, and, yeah. But it, you know, there, well, and then we, we went to we, I, we went to. It seems like many <laughs> mezcal <laughs> distilleries. And there's three <laughs> ways of making it. There's the mezcal you get in the U.S., which is basically industrially made, just like every other uh -huh. liquor. There's yeah. the traditional method. And then there's the ancestral method, which is the most traditional. What is that method? Um, so what they do, the mezcal is made, as you know, from agave. By the way, Scott, just go ahead and, uh, and do your thing. I, I shouldn't really go into a Oh, mezcal. no, no, no. Okay. I, want, I want to hear this, actually. It's made from this agave plant. The plant will grow many, many years before you can harvest it, like 8 to 15. Wow. So yeah. one of the reasons, I have a theory, the reason there's not a lot of vegetables in their diet is because every... Every inch of arable land <laughs> is dedicated to mezcal <laughs> production. Yeah. So there's agave everywhere. So they chop off the spiny leaves, and underneath the root is like a pineapple. They actually call it like a pina. It's like the pineapple. They pull that up. They roast it. They grind it up. They have a, uh, I have some pictures of a mill with a donkey or a horse pulls the millstone around and grinds it up. Wow. They ferment it in clay vats for an uh, extended length of time, and then they distill it twice. So that's the process, kind of like any other kind of liquor. The fermentation creates alcohol. Now, is, and now what's the relationship between mezcal and tequila? Tequila is a mezcal and not okay. the best tequila mezcal. Tequila is a type of mezcal. Yeah, and not the best mezcal. Uh, interesting. So. That's interesting. So you need to go to Oaxaca, yeah? I, I guess I guess I need to head to the food Oaxaca. Was, oh my God, the food was so good. And mm -hmm. of course, Amira Elgin. We went with Mike and Amira Elgin, and um, she knows everybody. So like we're we get, and she, she refuses to tell you what you're going to do ahead of time. So we get in the van. It's, it's uh, uh, twelve of us total: Amira, Mike, and eight, uh, four other couples. Oh, where'd you find it? Balsamic vinegar. <laughs> oh, it was with no, the balsamic vinegar. Balsamic vinegar. <laughs> well, there, that's there's the problem right there. Yeah. It's been sitting there for months. Yeah. This is Kid Mike knows. brought me this uh, last time he visited. This is a reposado. It, so typically the mezcal is clear because it has been aged, but this has been aged in. Uh, yeah, in I America. like the Hoven mezcal more than the reposado, but. Hoven. Yeah. Is that unreposado? That's the very white kind. Yeah, Hoven. It's young. The clear. Yeah, that's mostly what we had. The other thing is they drink it nonstop. Oh, do they? So everywhere you go, people are you're carrying around a glass and people are just pouring mezcal in <laughs> nonstop. And I don't, I, fortunately, I, I'm not a big drinker, so I was watching everybody else get wasted while I'm drinking. That's what I end up doing. Awa Jamaica. Is I see, you know, 15 other people all go and go and go, and I'm like, oh, this will be fun to watch whenever they're all just. God, I'm sorry. I've used up your time i'm much i'm much the same you know i have a little sips here and there i enjoy the flavor but uh, you yeah. know I, I don't get i don't want to get anymore. wasted i don't like i it. used to <laughs> yeah yeah same. that's why i yeah. don't anymore right yeah, learned my exactly. lesson scott can you hang out to the top sure, sure all right here we go leo laporte the tech guy <laughs> no one here gets out alive that's actually not the case so i just want to let you know you will 
Get out alive. Uh, 8888 Ask Leo is the phone number. Micah Sargent is with me. He's uh, he's my apprentice. Oh, this is a silly way to... My co-host. How about that? We'll promote you. That works. And on the line from Maine, it's another Micah. Hello, Micah. Hello? Oh, I picked up the wrong line. Hold on. Hold on. Kevin, you'll be next. Now... Oh, and I hung up on Micah. <laughs> Hello? Oh, now, who's that? Here we go. Okay, don't do what I do, Micah. Micah in Maine, if you call back now, it's Kevin in uh, Porter Ranch, California. Hello, Kevin. Hi, how are you? I am well. How are you? I'm good. Fascinating uh, pictures from uh, out there in Oaxaca. Oh, we had so much fun. It was a great vacation, yeah. Any, anyway, my question is about, uh, we have local stations here. I, I, I have for my TV service, uh, Direct TV Stream, and uh, they don't cut keep a lot of the local stations. I don't know who to write to about that. But anyway... Write I, to the local stations, because ultimately that's who's at fault. They charge uh, money to DirecTV, and often, uh, and you've seen this all the time, there's disputes, and at some point DirecTV says, no, I'm not going to pay. <laughs> I'm not going to pay that, because they have to pass it along to you. So often these disputes are because the locals want more money. Yeah, well, it's also the PBS stations and, um, like, the biggest local station here in L.A. I'm slightly out of the broadcast. I try. I tried using an antenna. I got yeah. an internal antenna, but that didn't work. That's the ideal, obviously, because uh, yeah. that's free over the air, and often the quality uh, of it with an antenna is better yeah. uh, than anything else, including cable, and uh, because they don't have to compress it as much. I've However... Always- I'm only about 28 to 30 miles from the tower, and so I don't know why I'm in like some kind of shadow. Maybe I need an external antenna. I don't know about that. Well, I'll tell you a couple of sites you can go to and figure that out. One is TVFool, TVFool.com. Okay. And uh, Antenna Web also has it. But TVFool, uh, there's a third one I'll try to remember, but TVFool, you'll enter your zip or your address, and it will tell you the signal strength of all the locals. Mm-hmm. And where to animate an antenna, and even give you some help as will Antenna Web on which antenna you'll need. And yes, you're right; it's probably not a rabbit ears. It's, yeah, it's probably I mean, something on your roof. Or internal antenna was a big fail. So yeah, no, you're going to need something better. So AntennaWeb.org will give you a list of the uh, pr- they call it antenna signal prediction. Okay. And they'll give you ideas of what antennas and so well, forth. Well, my other question is. Um, in the meantime, I've been using, I've been airplaying the website because they have the live sure, stream for sure. the channel. Yeah. And I was using the iPhone, but the iPhone was always dropping out. I don't know why. But um, I use my M1 Mac, and it's beautiful. Nice. It streams perfectly. Nice. But then I got the idea, oh, I'd like to use my Mac at the same time while I'm watching. No, the- no. No. <laughs> So, so no, uh, not gonna do it. It 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 does do it, but I I can't seem to arrange spaces. Right, because uh, Mac is what's happening with AirPlay is it's mirroring your Mac. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can maybe arrange it so that you have. It seems like I, yeah, I don't think it shows up as two uh, monitors. It would if you hard connected it. If you if you uh, took an HDMI cable and you can get a, a USB C to an HDMI adapter, plug that into the TV, then you could tell the Mac, uh, I have two monitors, and show this on the second monitor. Don't mirror them. Show this as an extended monitor on the second monitor, and then you could use your Mac. Oh, okay. So but yeah, I think you, I don't think AirPlay will do that. I think AirPlay just shows whatever's on the screen at, at any given time. Okay. Well, we'll we'll, we'll try something like that in the meantime because I'm I you know we we love our local stations and so we can't can't get it. So what a lot of people do now. So I'm going to give you some acronyms. I hate them, but they're good shorthand. OTA is over the air. That's you know the antenna thing, and OTT is over the top, which is just another way of saying through the internet. It's on top of your internet connection. And there are good ways to get locals OTT. Unfortunately, the courts have put the free way uh, of doing it, low cast, out of business, at least for now. Um, They were doing it completely free. There are inexpensive ad-supported over-the-top solutions like Pluto and Fubi, 
But if you're willing to pay, I, you know, this is my favorite way of getting TV in general, YouTube TV from Google. It's 65 bucks a month, but it gives you all your locals plus a bunch of other... It's like basic cable, in effect. It's the same price as basic cable. It gives you a lot of stations. It has built-in DVR capabilities, so... Uh, Frequently, I'll say, oh, record this show, or I make sure you get every every 49ers football game, that kind of thing, and it will automatically record those. You can have five different DVRs, so you can have members of your family can get their own recordings that uh, don't overlap with yours. Uh, it's the only draw drawback is it's expensive, and again, I think you can blame the locals for this because the prices have been going up as the locals, and, you know, frankly, cable like ESPN charge more and more per customer. Well, um, they pass that along. I lean on is these local stations because there's no reason we shouldn't be getting PBS. And, and I agree. So and you can get PBS just fine. Uh, on I would look at YouTube TV. They have a, f a free trial, and, uh, okay. and, and just see. Then it's just you don't have to worry about an antenna. It's just over the internet. You have to have a good internet connection, of course. One other thing I wanted to say, I just thank you for recommending the M1 uh, iMac. It's, it's the best computer. Oh, I'm so glad you like it. Now, Micah, you said you, there is a way to extend your desktop with AirPlay. Yeah, and I didn't know this. I thought that it was only mirroring. Uh, so when you go into the, the menu at the top and you choose screen mirroring and you choose your AirPlay device, afterward, in that same menu, you will see a section that says AirPlay and the Apple TV you're AirPlaying to. And then you can choose, uh, use no as idea. separate display. No idea. So yeah, so yeah there'll be different options that pop up, including mirror the built-in display that you have, or use as separate display. So you would just click, use a separate display, and that would bring it up as a secondary display. And then you mentioned kind of having trouble understanding uh, maybe where the display was. If you launch system preferences after that on your Mac and you choose displays, you can decide where the arrangement is of that Apple TV sort of in the virtual space that you've created. So if you don't know if you're supposed to drag to the left or to the right or up or down, that part of system preferences can help you out. So maybe you've already figured, uh, maybe you've already figured this out, Kevin, because it sounds like you were trying to use spaces to do that. I was trying to use spaces, but I was a little confused. So yeah, I don't blame you. I was too, apparently. A couple tries. Yeah. But, uh, I've yeah. thrown everything at this M1 Mac, and I can't get it to dog. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It is a beast. I, I think, uh, really, the the, the in most interesting tech story of uh, of the year is, uh, and it's been a whole year now since these came out, but is Apple's move away from Intel into designing its own silicon, which has, frankly, caused Intel and AMD and others to think rethink their strategies and has created, I think, a very powerful new pathway forward for uh, for computing. Um, so, uh, you know, good good on Apple. They're doing some amazing engineering. These are amazing uh, devices. Yeah. I'm glad you're happy. I think they're about two years ahead of everybody else is what I feel like. Yeah, at least. I, there's some argument that they're, they have a lead that cannot be erased because of how they're doing it. Remember, their big advantage is they make everything. The hardware, the silicon, the operating system. And so they can very much finely tune what they're doing. It's what Tesla has. They have all the data about how people drive their cars and they make the entire thing, including the hardware and the software. Uh, those That's a real advantage. It's hard for somebody like Intel and AMD, which is making off-the-shelf hardware, you know, that ready-to-made. It's the difference between a tailored suit and an off-the-rack suit. Uh, Apple has an advantage there that's going to be hard to beat. Anyway, thank you for the call. There's some at least some options for you. And uh, now we return you to Scott Wilkinson. Woohoo! Here is a picture of a magay, of an ag agave plant. They chop the tops off, the pina, and mm -hmm. there's the. This is the mill they use. So they'll attach a horse to this. It goes around, or a mule. Yeah. Uh, and it goes around and around and mills it. That's some roasted maguey that's that's uh, they've already done their milling for the day. So, and then they oh, so they push it into the middle after. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. And then uh, let me see. Here's here's the still. This is the traditional method, not the ancestral method. So you're using copper. The ancestral method uses clay, a clay still. Mm. So is this when they impart the smoked quality to it? It just you know I asked them how do you get the qualities because you're distilling it twice. They, did, they didn't really say anything. So it's dripping out into a bucket, right? You can't really see it, but right down here it's dripping out into a it's bucket. It's a trade secret. 
Well, I think the distilling. So, I don't know if you've ever visited a liquor factory, <laughs> <laughs> as they call no, them in the U.S. As, as we call them here, but um, there's different parts of the distillate. So there's the, there's like at least three stages, and you know you capture usually one of them. One of them will kill you. Yeah, the bathtub <laughs> stage. Uh, and then, but yeah, right. so <laughs> my guess is that they're keeping part, not just the middle perfect alcohol stage, but a little bit of the other another stage, so they get some of the flavor because they're definitely distinct, and some are more um, fruity. They're all a little smoky. But, you know, that area in Mexico is pretty much smoky anyway. <laughs> <laughs> You're just constantly. <laughs> the, the kitchens are uh, wood-fired. They're wood oh, they're wow. fire so, kitchens. Yeah. The traditional yeah. ones are. So, uh, you know, I was getting smoked out most of the time. <laughs> uh, were you staying at a hotel? No. We were, uh, Mike and Amira had a, uh, a villa that had enough rooms for everybody. It was a, a famous Mexican singer who would like to bring her band to stay in the villa. There's a recording studio in it. Wow. Oh, and, man. Uh, and so we all had room. We had our own rooms and bathrooms. Um, here's an example. This was there is, an interpreter along or did you? Did Amira speak? speaks Spanish. Okay. She's um, she's uh, from El Salvador. So she, yeah, because none of us. So this is an example of a fire kitchen. So that they make the tortillas on that, but it's all wood. Oh, that's amazing. It's all wood burning. Fire. Yeah. You see, there's a modern Samsung refrigerator, but, <laughs> but, but they want. But, so it's not that they couldn't cook it over it's electric, like but to. they choose to cook it over wood. That's the traditional. Oh man, people are probably screaming for that authenticity. Oh my God, the flavors. So this is the cooking class we took, which was oh fun. You got to actually learn. Yeah, we, what were you making? Oh everything. Everything. Yeah, I don't want to bore everybody. I'm gonna I'm gonna let Scott have the floor. And... Okay. Well, uh, one quick question re regarding that last phone call. Um, Last time I looked at all the uh, local channel TV over the top kind of options, YouTube TV and so on, none of them carried PBS. Is that no longer true? I haven't looked in a while. Oh, and maybe PBS doesn't let them. Let me just look at my. That's TV what I'm thinking. Dot YouTube.com. I'm pretty sure I get PBS, but you, you know what PBS true, does is they sell their own. You know, if you subscribe, you, they app, have their own yeah. app. So let me see. Seven. That, that, yeah, yeah. I get KQED on uh, YouTube TV. You do? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, In fact, then I get changes, several so. PBS channels. I get KQED, KVIE. I get a number of PBS channels. All the ESPN channels. YouTube TV is a pretty good deal. I got. I mean, it's expensive, but it's... Mm -hmm. And then, I, <laughs> talk about expensive. They charge you an additional 20 bucks if you want 4K. Yes. But yes. the Olympics... Yeah, but the Olympics oh, were in 4K. Oh, must have been amazing. It was gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So LA, Paris, uh, somebody in the chat room says LA does have PBS. Certainly San Francisco stations do. Because that's well, what I get. Well, then it changed. That, that's new from the last time I looked, which was a while they ago. They also get Turner watch. Classic Entirely. Movies, which is like, if it doesn't have that, I'm not watching. Because <laughs> I like old movies. It's yeah, got sure. a lot of the basic cable, Bravo and Court TV uh -huh. and stuff, Food Network, HGTV, right. all that stuff. So I, Somebody in the chat room was mentioning how, how they didn't like the fact that all over the top TV was so segmented with apps and stuff and you've got you've got YouTube TV with the basics but if you want Discovery Plus that's going to be a different app probably yeah uh, I mean so Showtime and HBO Max you have to pay for Netflix yeah, yeah you have to pay for them you have to pay for but I'm getting a, I mean if you look go look at YouTube TV's rundown it's it's I don't know lots of stations mm. so um Including a lot of sports, a ton of sports, all the news stations, Movie Max. Yeah, well, There's a ton of stuff. Couldn't couldn't care less about sports other than baseball. But well, you're in you know. in the minority there, Mr. Wilkinson. I know, I know. <laughs> this I understand. All the geeks I work with. See, I like sports, but I hate comic book movies. So, <laughs> and I love comic. Books. I know you do. <laughs> so what am I going to say? So Fox Sports has a 4K uh, channel. There's not a lot of 4K, obviously. So on the basic YouTube package, well, I'm paying for 4K, but there's not a lot of broadcasting done in 4K. Well, that's true. Yeah. So here's NBC true. Sports in 4K, Fox Sports in France. Most of it's sports. I'm afraid. You really want to see all that dust all over their yeah. uniforms <laughs> yeah. as they slide into yes. home. No more of that this year. 
Man, I saw on this year on uh, baseball there were a couple of shots they they had cams in the bases. Oh yeah, that's the new thing. Yeah, the the yeah, base that was amazing. the base cam. Well, it's, base football cam. started that by putting it in the pylons, and uh, they realized, oh, I could put a small camera, a wireless camera out there. You notice it's not live, but uh, right, right. they it's can't live, stream that high correct. quality. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's okay. Fun. So I'm looking at YouTube TV channel listing here with my i see discovery animal planet smithsonian oh, sci-fi discovery okay it's just discovery plus it's the paid stuff that you don't it's get. basically basic cable all the basic cable channels you get yeah okay so i here i do see pbs yep. yeah two two pbs channels in la yep. bunch of sports yeah scott's got some noise in his oh no really don't worry about it We'll get, we'll, we'll, you can, if you, I guess if you want to, you only have a minute left anyway, you could unplug and replug your USB connection. Oh, okay. That's I've what got, it is. All right, all right. Hang on, then I will. <laughs> Sundance. Huh? Okay, yeah. I'm back now. Yeah, did, all better. Did that do it? Mm -hmm. All better. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, Damn no, it's not all better. So maybe it was Zoom. No. You want some mezcal? <laughs> I would love some. <laughs> no, not at the moment. It's only noon here. They don't uh, noon, export yeah, most of the yeah. mezcal. Can I smell that, they don't. Yeah, yeah. They don't export out of the uh, out of Mexico. It's too much trouble, and there's plenty of a market in Mexico. Apparently, <laughs> oh, come on here. Have a little. Uh, uh, Redacted is asking if I have a recommendation for under hundred hundred dollar desktop speakers, and I don't because I don't spend a lot of time with desktop speakers. These were an, an unusual situation for me, so sorry. I could do a little research and maybe come back at you next week. Um, yeah, my audio's getting a buzz. That's too bad. I thought it was silenting for sure, but I think it's Zoom. Sometimes, you know, any digital medium will get out of sync. Like will get out of get out of whack. Yeah. All right, um, we got to run anyway. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, Robo Thanks Thanks Scott. Bye bye, Robo Scott. Bye, 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 bye. <laughs> well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, and all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number if you have a question, a comment, a suggestion, if you'd like to talk high tech. 888 827-5536, toll free from anywhere in the U.S. and Canada. Website where everything is written. As it is spoken, so it shall be written. TechGuyLabs.com. That's thanks to James DeRuvo, our fine scribe. Back to the phones we go. Finally. I'm sorry, Mike. I didn't mean to I press too many buttons, and one of them cut you off. Micah from Maine joining Micah Sargent in the studio. <laughs> hey, Micah. It's a tech guy with Micah and Micah. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Which is very unusual, and that's one of the things I, I called about. Micah, you know, I'm about Leo's age, which makes us both old guys, but I've had the name Micah for quite some time uh -huh. before it was at all popular. And, by the way, it drives me crazy that you're on the air, because whenever I hear your name, I look around. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I apologize. Is it, it's a biblical name, but, right? Yep, that's, it, uh, that's where mine came from, at least. Yeah. The, so it's been around for a couple of thousand years. Yeah, and, and, and we spell our names differently, even though we're both Micah. Mine was supposed to be a C, but the nurse misspelled it, and my mom liked it that way, so she kept it. So I was originally supposed to be M-I-C-A-H. And he's M-I-K-A-H, and Micah from Maine. That's the only way I know the difference, <laughs> is a C. That, that, that's how we do it. But I'm wondering if you went through the same things being a little younger than I did, where everybody called you Mike and didn't understand what your name was and always spelled it wrong. Even my grandmother never spelled my name right. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. In school all the time. Mika. I had a teacher who told me, I corrected him. I said, no, it's pronounced Micah. He said, eh, Mika, Micah, same difference. Um, no, that's my name, sir. Thank you. So, yeah, I had a lot of that. Redacted in the chat room said if we could only get two more Micahs, then we'd have four Micahs. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, but none of us are flaky like the flaky mineral for Micah. <laughs> anyway, I, the conversation you had with Scott, I wanted to bring up another over-the-top streaming service that I haven't tried yet but I'm very interested in is the new Direct TV stream because it's a true cable replacement. And when you go with their premium line, which is very expensive, 
but so is cable. It gives you everything you get on cable, including your HBO, your Showtime, all your Cinemax channels, your Stars channels. This is very confusing to me because originally DirecTV was a satellite TV. But then they, and, and it was it's what you just described, right? It was a satellite TV to replace cable. It had your locals, it had everything. And then at some point a few years ago, they started doing streaming direct TV, which is not satellite. It's just over your internet. But it didn't have all of the features of the satellite direct TV. They still offer satellite TV. But now the stream is starting to catch up with what satellite has always offered. Yeah, and they're top of the line program. And I find that when you're going over the top, if you do a direct compare to cable TV, getting all the same channels and all the same premium channels, compared to going over the top, getting them the same way over the top, it's the same price. It doesn't really make a lot of difference if you're getting the same programming. Isn't that you interesting? Up, you know why that is, of course. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a conspiracy against uh, the consumer, Maybe. It's, it I know it's illegal to collude, but uh, there's nothing to stop you from going over to, to the website and saying, what are they charging? Oh, that's good. We could charge that much. Um, it's... Uh, we, <sighs> we are in a transition period I think between it started with broadcast TV and then, you know, you had three channels. If you're as old as I am, Micah, you remember that um, you had, you know, your network channels. Um, in fact, it was really CBS and NBC dominated. ABC was kind of the weak second. Then along came things like the CW and stuff. But but then can cable TV and of course, cable was for people who, like me, live in the rural area, can't get uh, via antenna, the locals. And so they basically put up a big antenna and dug literally drug, dug cables to people's houses to connect you to the giant antenna. They've gotten a little more sophisticated in that sense. In fact, Internet is really the big change. Uh, even cable TV now really is as much an Internet service as anything else. Um, and so we're in this transition phase between the way it used to be with live local stations and network broadcasters and all internet all the time. What's really interesting, if you look at the Emmy Awards and uh, just in general, is that the streamers, the, not, the, not the networks, but Netflix, Amazon Prime, uh, Apple TV, they're making the award-winning high-quality shows. They're, the interim transition is difficult for companies like HBO and Showtime because they're still dependent on cable subscribers. They don't want to annoy Comcast and Cox and Spectrum because they need them. But ultimately, wouldn't HBO prefer to sell direct to you, Micah, and say, hey, you know, it's 15 bucks. Give it to us. Don't give half to the cable company. But it, but it, and you would think in the end that would make it less expensive. It's not. You know, they're but that's you know, and that's what they're doing because now you can get HBO Max selling directly that's to you. Right. But because I have HBO with my cable company, I get it for free as right. well. So that's kind of how they're doing it, right? They're trying to keep the cable company appeased until they inevitably put them out of business. <laughs> of course, the big cable companies knew this was coming and became internet service providers and know that you'll still need them, right? And they slowly Absolutely. raised the cost of internet service. To, to compensate. So roughly now, the cost of internet service is the same as basic cable in most places. Maybe a little more expensive even. If I, if I drop my, my cable service, my TV service, my internet goes up to $75 a month. For exactly. Just down and 10 for up. just for internet. And, yeah. Right. And so if I do that and I add my direct TV streaming, which is $139 to get all the exact same thing, it costs me more than the $213 I'm paying per month now for everything that I'm getting on cable and plus the internet. So it, it makes no sense. When you put it all together, the prices are the same. There's, like, there's some kind of crazy collusion going on. It really well, it's it's also it's always and you know, we've seen this over and over again as as uh, uh, technology has changed business models, it the disruption is always a mess, and then we're in that middle of that mess right now in television. Where do I watch this show? It's on what Paramount Plus? What the hell is that? Uh, Peacock? Who's Peacock? So it's very confusing for end users, but that's because we're in this transitional phase. Uh, I think it will settle down eventually. I hope it will. With the FCC not allowing the free use of fiber as they do copper, 
there's the monopoly there so that you can't, you know, it it costs a fortune to be able to get your fiber cable. And uh, until the FCC says, hey, what's the difference between copper and fiber? Oh, nothing. Okay, we need to regulate it the same way. (laughs) Well, and I'm not going to fully blame uh, the government in this because they are basically, uh, you know, thanks to lobbyists and campaign donations, doing what the big cable companies uh, want them to do, telecom companies. I should just say telecom because AT&T owns DirecTV now. So it's really all about the big telecom companies. Uh, They're dominant. They dominate the FCC. Uh, and, you know, a lot of the FCC commissioners are former lobbyists. The former uh, chairman was a lobbyist for Verizon. So it is a revolving door between the two of them. And I think the cable companies are getting and the communications companies are getting what they want, which well, is expensive AT&T. stuff, you know, and we have no choice and a monopoly. And AT&T owns HBO and DirecTV. Yeah. So in, ev- in, in effect, the, 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 the breakup of the monopoly that was done oh, with the movie theaters worse. and the studios years it's ago worse. back together. They own the distribution and the creation. And uh, don't get me started on Comcast, which owns NBC Universal. It's a mess. Uh, and, and regulation has done nothing to solve that, uh, unfortunately. So, I, you know, we're just... It's not a great solution. And frankly, I think the Internet, in general, we've got problems with how the internet works uh, because of these monopolies, these regional monopolies. So it's a, it's a, we pay more for the uh, internet in the U.S. and in most countries, and we get worse service than in most countries. So, But, but that's not why I called. Oh! <laughs> well, I wish you'd told me, because i got to take a break. Hang on, all right? Uh, <laughs> the Tech Eye Podcast brought to you today by AT&T Active Armor. All right, picture this. You've spent the day staring at your phone, waiting for that one call from the, the job, the hospital, the family, and it finally rings. And who is it? Oh, you know, a robot. Don't let fraud calls disappoint you. AT&T makes your security a top priority. Fraud calls blocked. Spam notifications. Proactive network security. AT, it's called AT&T Active Armor. It's not complicated. AT&T Active Armor 24-7 proactive network security, fraud call blocking, and spam notifications to help stop threats at no extra charge. Compatible device and service required. Visit att.com slash active armor for details. I can smell that mezcal from here. Sorry, Micah. What what did you want to know? <laughs> I'm pretty sure I already know the answer, but I wanted to double check. I use an iPhone 6S because it still works, and why get rid of it? I've got 128 gigabytes of memory on that. When I buy a phone, I just get the maximum storage because you never know what's going to happen. A friend of mine gave me his old iPhone 7 because he switched to Verizon, and it wouldn't work with that. It's an older phone that doesn't go from CDMA to right. GSM. Right. And it's only got, and I've got. You're going to, uh, by the way, whoever your carrier is, you're going to have to face that as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you know that. But I'm fine. I'm fine with GSM right now. I'm with right. T-Mobile. So, okay. but uh, the iPhone 70 gave me only has 32 gigabytes of memory on it, and I have Ugh. 41 gigabytes of programs on mine already. Uh, yeah, Apple doesn't even sell a phone that it. small anymore. No. So there is a setting on uh, the iPhone to to offload unused programs. It'll watch what you don't use, and it'll only leave a little icon and the data and erase all the rest. I don't think that's going to solve your problem. I think you're going to actually have to go through manually and delete stuff. Are you also, uh, do you have your photos set to not keep local versions of those photos? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, use Google yeah. That's the first thing to do, yeah. yeah. So you are really running up against the space already, I think. Well, I'm not surprised. I mean, 32 gigs is yeah. tiny. We hear that. We're like, what? Yeah. I, I was going to switch over from the 6S to the uh, 7, but I don't think I can do it. And I don't think I'm just going to use the 7 as a as an iPod, more or less. This is your last year. This You can still get iOS 15 on the 6S. You're still kind of in the, in the mix. But it's probable that next year you won't be able to get iOS 16, and it'll start. You'll start really feeling the pain. You could always trade in and that six S and seven for a new one whenever yeah. that time comes. Oh, that's a good point. And that's what. That's a great point. Yeah. You got the seven and the six S. You might be able to get enough scratch together. You know, you might wait for. I don't know if you like a bigger phone, but sometime this year, I bet you Apple does it. The next SE. Mm-hmm. 
which is always a well, great. Well, and I'm also looking forward to the uh, the periscope telephoto lens that's going to come out on the 14th. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's up to you. Yeah, up to you. When I take my photos of aircraft, I think that periscope telephoto oh, lens you need it. across the airport is going to make a big difference. You need it, yeah. I have to say, I, I was uh, very impressed both, uh, and I have the 12 uh, with the Pixel 6 and the 12, both got just, Pixel uh, 12 gets better video, Pixel 6 does have that ultra zoom. I have to say, you know, it gets a little, looks a little bit like um, a Van Gogh as you zoom in. <laughs> uh, it's not super crisp. But uh, still pretty amazing what you could take a picture of. Yeah, I, I just don't see any need to continually upgrade year after year after year if it's still working. And, yeah, when I finally oh, I'm go so to with 16, you. absolutely. Yeah, I'm so you know, with that, you. That's when I'll do it. Yeah, I want to use it till, till the wheels fall off, more or less. Yeah, it's just like driving a car. <laughs> till so. the bottom rusts out. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Micah. Great to talk to you. Nice to talk to another Micah. I don't get to say hello, Micah, very often. I'm really happy I was able to do that. Well, goodbye, Micah. It was uh, nice to talk to you, too. <laughs> Take care, guys. Actually, not guys. Which guy? One guy. Oh, I have heard this. 57 channels, nothing on. This is a perfect song for our conversation today. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888, ask Leo. That's Professor Laura over there. Uh, spinning the discs. She's she's got that you know one headphone thing where she's just got the left headphone on and the other is off her ear so she can talk. And she is our official DJ for the show. Kenny on the line from Cottontown, Tennessee. Hello, Kenny. Hello, Leo. Hello, Micah. Hello. Welcome. What can I do for you? What can we do for you? Well, I'm calling, as you probably know, uh, since uh, you went on vacation, Apple released Mac OS Monterey. Um, I, as you probably know, I have a Mac, and I also have it set up where I can run not just the Mac OS on the actual Mac itself, but one of the things I think is cool, and I guess Windows does it as well, is you can run the same thing on an external drive as long as you can plug it in and it runs and it reads uh, properly. And... I tried to do that with Monterey on the external drive because it's nice to always have a backup in case one or the other goes bad. Well, guess what happened, Leo, when I tried to install macOS Monterey on an external drive? What happens? Well, it did not read, and I basically had to restore it at least two or three times. Wow. And I even went through the time machine route, and it still will not be able to run. And the thing is, this is a Vectrotech 4 terabyte solid state drive that I have. And it's I a formatted, uh, you know, look at it with disk utility. It's formatted APFS. That's the Apple file system. Yes? Yes. Um, and the Monterey installer sees it. And offers you the chance to uh, install on it, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. But it just, the install fails. Yes. Hmm. And really my feeling is, is that it probably has more to do with the compatibility issue. If I'm not mistaken, isn't Monterey really the first operating system that they put together since launching Apple Silicon or was it Big Sur? No, Big Sur was for Apple Silicon because we're a year out, believe it or not. Uh, and it is the case that even before that, Catalina, Apple started to make major changes to the operating system. You probably noticed, I mean, you'd have to look, but if you used uh, the drive utility, disk utility, you've probably noticed that even just a plain old install on your internal hard drive has two partitions, a system partition and a data partition. And the system partition is read-only. So they've started to really mess with, and this is for security reasons, how the system works. Um but if you have, and how is the hard drive connected? Is it's via the USB C connector, right? It's a, is it a Thunderbolt drive or a USB drive? It's a USB drive. I can't think of any reason. I'm looking at your drive, the Vectotech Rapid two terabyte drive, and yeah, I'm struggling here too. So Jojo Dance in our chat room says something which is weird, but it might be worth a try. Exactly the opposite of what I said. Do not format it with APFS. Instead, format it with HFS plus journaled and install Monterey on top of it. And Monterey will then convert it to APFS and apparently will work. Now, I have not tried this. That's bizarre. <laughs> yeah, that is definitely bizarre. That's the first I've really heard of that type of technique. Yeah. FFS, but never of that type of setup. 
Is I the installer also on the external drive, or are you using an installer you have on the Mac to install it on the external drive? Does that make sense? Oh, it, it makes sense. And basically what I do is I download it. Put it on a USB on key. Or you just yeah. off, or the internal drive, yeah. So yeah, it's some yeah, sort yeah. of weird, it sounds to me like it's some sort of weird uh, issue. You know, this is, uh, this is the upgrade path that Monterey would use with an older drive. It would say, oh, your HFS, fine, no problem, I'll, I'll fix it. I bet you it still does have to do something. There's a there's a new drive signing feature which started with Catalina where that read only system file has to be signed by Apple. Uh and and uh that's a little tricky as well. All of this is, comes from security. I can only think that that's what's going on. This is obviously not how Apple wanted to do it that you would have format it with, with an old file system, but uh it sounds like this is a workaround if this really works and Another couple of people in the chat room saying, yeah, that's it. So at least give it a try. That's the best we can do. Format it with the old file system, HFS journaled, HFS plus journaled, and then boot up into your installer. You'll, it'll see the drive just as before and let it install. And apparently what it'll do is convert to APFS. It'll probably do that weird partitioning. And I bet you it's the partitioning that's causing the problem would be my guess. Yeah, that probably is because mine has got a lot of storage space on it, so there should be no reason for it to uh, it, not. Are you preserving out. other stuff on the drive? It's a blank drive. No. It's a blank drive, no. right? Used specifically to run Mac OS. Okay, yeah. Um, that's weird. I you know th I do remember there were issues for in the beta with uh, people who wanted to do this. They did not recommend it, but I don't think it was because it didn't work. I think there were other issues. Um, if you want to run macOS in an external drive, make sure that you opt for flash storage. Apple's APFS is optimized for SSD. Well, we know it's not a spinning drive, is it? No, it's no. not. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking at troubleshooting issues. Um, yeah. I don't know where they're getting this. Sounds like they might have tried it and it worked. It sounds like a workaround. Doesn't sound like any official Apple policy. It would be cuckoo. Right. But choose Mac OS Extended Journaled as the format. Mac OS Extended yeah, Journal is. I did try that. Oh, okay. I did try that, and it wouldn't even take it for some reason that yeah. you have to run it as AFPS. Yeah, yeah. Beats me. Beats me. I don't know. Use uh, disk utility. Install it as journaled. I mean, wipe the drive and make it a journal blank drive and then try. See if that works. All right. All Best right. we can do. If somebody knows, call us, give us a ring, or uh, visit the 8888-ASK-LEO or visit the uh, chat room at irc.twit.tv. Those people are kind of, I call them team tech guy. Uh, now you're on the team. Micah Sargent's also here, and he's an expert on this kind of stuff too. So um, I'm sure Michael will be doing some research while I tell you about our fine sponsor, uh, the folks at... No, I don't have to do an ad. <laughs> Never. No ad. What, what am I talking about? You know, I go away for one week and my <laughs> brain is scrambled. Uh, no, it's, I guess I, I could get ahead, but let's not. Uh, we're going to take a break. When we come back, Johnny Jet. Hi, Johnny! Hello, Leo. He's here. He's ready. I can tell him all about my global entry experience and uh, and flying internationally for the first time in two years. And actually, it was very easy. The only thing to get back in the U.S., I had to have a COVID test. They did the easy antigen one, so-called. Still reached into my brain. <laughs> uh, my, tear, my eyes teared up a little bit. But uh, yes, it's the first time ever I've been able to say COVID-free. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I did fly the Embraer. So, yeah, it was a 747-800. Why are you showing me a no. USB key, John? Well, I, this is a Monterey. Yeah, no, we know you can do that. That's not what he wants to do. He wants to have a dual boot system, one with an external drive uh, that's got Monterey on it. What, Johnny? What did, did you, you say? Did you say you flew the 747? No, 737-800. Okay, well, that's not Embraer. That's Boeing. No, and that, well, it was, you remember, it was two two flights. Right. So, so we flew to Houston to on the 737, okay. and then the Embraer from Houston a to... Embraer's nice. Oh, it was very nice. 
And were you up front, I hope? Yeah, of course. Did you get the uh, single aisle or you guys sat No, no, we sat sure. together. Sat yeah. Together. I like the single aisle. Enough. Well, yeah, if you're alone. <laughs> Actually, come I'm to think alone, of it, I'm just Lisa kidding. got the single aisle going uh, from Houston. She did. She said, oh, it's fine. And then it's a very short flight to Mexico City. Coming back, we went through Mexico City, and that's only an hour. So that we didn't we didn't get much. But yeah, the Embraer is very nice. It was very. Yep. It's a nice jet, nice little jet. I used we to had, hate them. But I used to dread them, but now why? they make the overhead bins longer, oh, uh, yeah, wider. Big, the bins were big enough to accommodate our luggage. I yeah. followed in your um, uh, footsteps, footsteps by only carry on on the way down. But we bought a suitcase in Oaxaca because we brought hey, so that's much. That's the way to do it. Brought so much stuff back, and then I don't care if I check it because uh, you know it can get lost and come later. That's fine. If I'm going to buy stuff, which is very rare, I do pack a, a small, you know, compact duffel bag that can fit in my carry-on. That's what we and should have done. The, yeah, yes. So it will save you money. And for the, yes. Next time we'll do you, that. And then you put your old clothes in that bag, you check it, and then you keep all the valuables you bring on in the carry-on. Yeah. That you bought. Exactly. Yeah, my camera and my laptop and all that stuff, I still carry oh, you it never on. check yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is your experience with lost luggage? You always, I, very rarely do you lose it forever, right? Uh, no, I've never lost my luggage. First of all, I've rarely checked luggage until I had kids. Yeah. So once you have kids, you got to start checking luggage. Yeah. And, but I have had my luggage lost at least three times. Air France lost it, took a couple days. But you get that it. Was even, it's just misrouted. You, you get it. Yeah. Yeah. There was, it takes time. But if it really does get lost, it ends up in Alabama. It, in Huntsville, actually not Huntsville, what? Scottsboro, at the unclaimed baggage <laughs> center. It's like a it's like a size of a Costco that sells everyone's stuff from wedding hey, rings to, to caskets. Don't sell my mezcal. Did you lose your bag? No, no, we didn't lose anything. It was great. It was e couldn't have been easier. It was very. I was you know mostly I was nervous about getting sick, getting COVID, and not being able to come back. So we were very happy when we got the negative tests, but uh, everybody did. Everybody in our group was fine because we were careful and we had private. Everything was, we didn't spend a lot of time in public. Um, well, actually, that's not true, but we were, they were all kind of, ex there was nobody else, you know, around and stuff. It was good. It was really fun. So you felt completely safe, COVID and yeah. obviously. Yeah, I had a great time. God, it was fun. Good. I'm and glad ate, you went. Only I'm ate too I... much food. That's the only <laughs> negative. It was really delicious. And did you delicious. post your photos publicly? Uh, I posted some on Instagram. I have processed them all, and I will... Where will I post them? I'll probably do a blog post. But yeah, Instagram has some stuff. Uh, okay, I'm good. Twit Leo on Instagram. And, and do you want to talk about on air what it was like coming back in? If you want. Cause I, it's up to I'm you. Interested. Up sure. to you. So... Did get my global entry, which I'm happy about. I don't know. I, it's funny because every time I see people, it's in the... In you the, had global entry though, right? No, I never had global entry. This never, is your first time using global entry. Didn't use it because I hadn't had the interview. And they, you know, they had that new thing where you can get the interview on sure. your way back in, but I haven't gone anywhere in two years. So did you do that? Yep. Just showed up. Just showed up. Well, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. He literally has been everywhere. Is there anywhere you haven't been, Mr. Johnny Jet? Oh, there's tons of places. There's, the world's a big place. But you've been to every continent, right? I've not been to Antarctica. Me neither. Someday. That's yeah, my hope. I don't really have a desire to go over the Drake Passage. Yeah. You can fly over it, so you know, that's the new thing. You don't have to sail right. it. Yeah. Right. Johnnyjet.com. That's his website. He's an expert on traveling and, of course, joins us every week to talk about traveling better with technology. For years, you've been urging me uh, to get that global entry thing. So there's a variety of ways to facilitate getting back into the country, or even just flying in general. There's TSA pre, the pre-check, right? Where if, if you're approved, it's a little easier. You don't have to take off your shoes. You don't have to take out your laptop. Although we didn't have to take out our laptops uh, on some of the uh, security lines. I don't know why. I think in Houston we didn't. But anyway. Uh, and you're then, on pre-check. No, I no, I was just normal. I was a normal human, like the okay. rest of us. Uh, there's if you're going into and out of Canada a lot, there's Nexus. I think there's one for uh, Mexico too. And then there's kind of the the big daddy of it all. It's 150 bucks global entry. Hundred dollars. Hundred dollars. Okay. Yeah. Global. So global entry. entry is a hundred dollars. It includes 
TSA Pre, which is $85. So spend the $15 extra Worth because yeah. TSA Pre is just for domestic security, but. global entries for immigration. But Nexus is $50 and they're all, they all last five hours. Uh, five sorry, years. Five years. And <laughs> yeah, Nexus includes global entry and TSA Pre. So that's the way to do it. But you have to do the interview. Wait a minute. So uh, Nexus is Canada. better yeah, than the bucks. others. But and you have to do it in Canada. You do, or on a U.S. border okay. uh, city of Canada. So I, yeah. But it includes global entry, and it's half the price. I so if I you go to a, Canada a lot, it's the way to do it. The guy in my interview. So so you get in, now you can do it as you come into the country from an international flight. You still have to go through the normal CBP check, right. and they welcome you back. And then I said, oh, and I'd like to do my global entry interview. And the guy's very nice. He said, well, come with me. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> and we walked across, you know, and, and he walked over to a booth and the guy says, OK, put your name on the list. It'll be I have to check these other people because he's checking in everybody from the flight. When that's done, about 45 minutes, you can do your interview. The interview is surprisingly lengthy. 15 minutes. Yeah, well, because they get your fingerprints and then they run it through the database to see if, right. you know, they know you. Uh, Did they know you, by the way? Did they recognize you? No. Okay, good. I've never been arrested, thank God. So they didn't have, I didn't have any priors. <laughs> and uh, then, but they ask you, they say, well, you know, have you ever had any immigration issues or anything like that? Um, they say, is this your address? They kind of, you know, they're, mm -hmm. but they, he was nice, but he was like, mm. is, uh, they look in your eyes. There's no rubber glove involved. But uh, other than that, it was, you know, it was a pretty, you know, it's good. Actually, I'm glad because you, once you have this, right, you're kind of trusted. Trusted traveler, that's what they call it. How, but I noticed it's not much faster to get in. You have to go over to a machine, you get your picture taken, you get a receipt, you have to bring it over to the same guy that's checking everybody else in, give them the receipt. But it's much faster. Is it? Okay, I mean, I'll trust definitely. you on that. I, I mean, maybe Houston was not crowded. So if it's We not did it in San airport, Francisco, SFO. Okay. Because we were coming back. We, uh, we went through Mexico City. So the first U.S. city on our way back was San Francisco. And San Francisco is usually packed. But although everyone well, in San was Francisco midnight. has... Everyone, it, okay. It was but late. everyone has global entry in San Francisco. So the tip is to use the mobile passport. Wait a because minute. What's that? <laughs> so the mobile passport is <laughs> just the app. app. You can download it for free. Yeah. And you can upload your stuff. If you pay, I think, $15 a year, you can get it, the stuff stored. Or fifteen dollars a month. Sorry. Oh, that's expensive. But otherwise, you just have to fill all your stuff out when you land, and you have to have a connection. So that's the but. mobile passport control app on iOS and Android. MPC. Now, I don't know why, but when we got in, they said, "Don't use the machines. Don't use the machines. Go to the person." Okay. So I don't so know what the hell. There must. It must have been uh, pretty empty. I assume. Yeah, it was pretty empty. Mobilepassport.us. If you want to know more on that. So but. that one. Would be f so. It's good to have all of the all of the choices, definitely. And then you just look at which line is shorter. Is that what you're saying? Definitely. I mean, yeah. same thing with security. I have TSA Pre and Clear, and sometimes I go the regular line if the others are long. And actually, this I wrote a post this week that went viral. I actually had four posts go viral. I never had more traffic in my life um, than this past week. Wow. And one of them was because I saw a tweet from Christina Warren. Who is a, Our good a media friend. personality? Yeah. Yes. So she wrote that she was in, she has TSA pre and clear, and she was in the Atlanta airport on Monday morning, and she had to wait an hour to 50, 55 minutes to get through both of those lines. And so I wrote a tip saying, you know, warning to travelers with clear TSA pre and elite status: don't just think you're going to breeze through like you have in the past. Make sure you show up to the airport early because if you don't and you miss that flight, there's not a lot of places the airlines can put you because flights are going out 88% full across the board, and there's just no place to put you. So you could be in the airport for days. So she and missed her flight because she was an hour, only allowed an hour to get through the pre-check line. Yeah. So do not assume. That exactly. you are in any way special. You are not a special snowflake. But that's just still like saved everybody her. else. It's still probably, she said it probably took almost two to three hours, I think, for the regular line. Wow. So you got to show up early. And, and my, Thanksgiving's actually, coming, by the way. This is when you're going to hit the, the rubber is going to hit the road. Well, it's a good thing you didn't come back on Monday because Monday is November 8th. Um, this is the first day the international borders are open for oh, foreign whoa. travelers. Wow. They're expecting Delta. I'm, I'm going to write this in my tip today in my newsletter. Um, Delta just said 
you know, basically pack your patience. It's going to be sloppy. <laughs> it's going to be long lines. It's going to be longer lines at the, at the land borders, but even at the airport borders, um, they're going to, people are going to be coming. All the flights are full. Delta said their flights all from Europe are full. Virgin Atlantic said the same for not just on Monday, but for the whole week and even the month. Wow. So wow. the airports are going to be crowded when you come in internationally. And these TSA pre these TSA checkpoint numbers are going to jump starting Monday or Tuesday because all these new travelers are coming in. They haven't been here in almost two years. I know. Tell me about it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's an it's an exciting time, but it's going to be a stressful time. The good news is that um, the uh, Biden administration uh, eased up on the federal vaccine mandate. So everyone was predicting because it was supposed to be it was supposed to start on November 22nd. And it was just, a, 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 you know, it was going to be you couldn't have a worse time. No. Yeah. So they postponed it to January 4th. They also gave the uh, employees a lot more leeway so i a think a big we proportion might have i was surprised I, was it you who told me a big proportion of the tsa personnel are not vaccinated yeah in october it was uh 40% were not vaccinated so that mandate could have knocked out a bunch of much Definitely. needed they're already, tsa personnel and they're already short 5000 people yeah. officers so yeah. um everything's good short news. where are all the people who are not working going what are they doing? <laughs> are they staying at home? What are they I, doing? I, I have no idea. <laughs> Come back to work, everybody. It's okay. <laughs> I did. Yeah, but I have a good, I have a big tip if we have time. Do we yeah, have time? we got a minute. Go ahead. Okay. So my, my other story that went viral this week was what something's really up at Southwest in America. And they had, you know, all kinds oh, of 1800 delays flights canceled. 1800 for Yeah, for And America. even today they have a lot of delays, both of them. So my point is both these guys are having problems with staffing issues. They're just overzealous and and um and just making their schedules just too fat too a fat. So once once there's some kind of weather, you know, they don't have enough backup. So And it and um, it ripples all the way down the line, right? Ripples. Yeah. It's a domino effect. Yeah. So my my advice is first of all, book the first flight out in the morning because you'll have a least likely chance yeah. of getting it canceled or delayed. But also Book a backup flight on another carrier through a different hub if you if you have to travel through one in a different part of the country, just in case there's bad weather, and do it for either three hours later or the next day, and just make sure it's either refundable or that you can use it towards a credit for the following year. And that way, you have a backup. I know it's not a popular tip because it's going to jack prices up, but it will protect you if you have to be somewhere. JohnnyJet.com, man, if you are into travel or you can't wait to get back to traveling, that's the place to go. JohnnyJet.com, follow him on Twitter and Instagram and right here, too. Thank you, JJ. Hey, thank you. Yeah, I just, I mean, I just wanted the card, the global entry card. I just wanted to be able to flash it. I'm global well, entry. I forget to mention, by the way, when you were talking about it, that it was a good thing you did not go through the global entry line without having that interview because you go through the, they well, would have just... I read the instructions. Would, you go right, through the regular of, line don't. and then you say, I would like my interview, please. And they go, okay, over there. And I went over there. The guy was very nice. Uh, they fingerprint all, your, all 10 of them. And uh, then they run it through the federal law enforcement databases. And they say, have you ever been convicted of anything? I guess it, any... In DUI, you get denied for, for Nexus. I, I'm not sure about global entry, but... No, you, you do. DUI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They say they're very clear. You can't you can't have nothing. Yeah. Which, you know, fortunately, I I don't know, somehow lucked out. Never got arrested. Yeah, I mean, too. I mean, well, Knock I'm on, fortunate, but I've been, yeah. <laughs> I've been a good Knock citizen. So, yeah. Well, you know, these things happen. Definitely. So, uh, Especially when you're younger. Yeah. I wish I'd gotten Nexus when I was uh, going to Canada. Then but I'd if you're not going to Canada right now, you don't need it. I don't need it. It's only for people going to Canada. I know. I okay. used to go to Canada every I, I, month. I hope but I, I made that clear. Gone. Yeah, no, I think you did. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so otherwise I mean, it was great. I, flight was easy. People were, everything was on time. Was it packed, the flight? Well, they were all full, yeah. I okay. would say they were all full. I didn't see any open seats, no. Okay. But but yeah, it was not it was orderly it was so we were on United and Aero Mexico, and they code share so it was uh, but it was very orderly they now have stanchions with the groups one two three four five six so you don't get everybody all trying to jam right. in there. It's a good idea. They've been yeah. doing it for a while. Yeah, that was a big improvement. Um, 
they, they call them, you know what the gate agents call these people? What? Who just line up without any yeah. line. They call them gate lice. That's their Gate lice. Terminal. They're all over the place. Yeah. I, I have to say, getting back into the country is tricky. Because you have to do, you have to go through a lot of hoops. Besides getting a COVID test, then you also have to get a QR code, answer a bunch of questions. And then at the gate, there's these people in uh, orange jackets who go around and they interview you and they you show them the QR code, you show them your test, and then they put a purple uh, sticker on the back of your passport. Uh, and then they also, there's something else they were doing and they were signing my ticket. So there's all this stuff, but all of that was in Mexico. Right. None of that was in the U.S. Well, like they assume the, if you got on the plane, you're cool. Well, because the government passed it on to... Yeah, they made them do it. The airlines. Yeah. And if the airlines do not do this, they'll get fined big uh -huh. money. I can't remember what it is. Each passenger. So they... So the, for to, instance, CBP, CBP never asked for my immunization right. status or COVID status or anything. They presume That's, if you got in here, you've passed the checks. Exactly. That's why on Monday, the air, the airports are going to be less crowded than the land borders because at the land borders, they don't know how many people are booked That's a to come issue. through. And yeah. also they have to check the, the status of all that stuff. So yeah. it takes time. That's a bigger issue. So um, they also, what is there, was something else I was going to tell you. My report from the front <laughs> um, it was very easy getting in. They didn't. They said you buy more than sixteen hundred bucks of stuff. No. Okay, fine. There was. They didn't give you that paper. You used to get a paper. They didn't get on the airplane. You didn't have to fill out the immigration thing. Uh, the uh, declaration form. Declaration. You didn't have to do that anymore. I don't know if they've. That's, not, not not even online in Mexico. No, but even nope. coming into the U.S., they didn't have to do it. It was right. like what the. I thought. We, I told Lisa save all your receipts. We get nothing. Um, okay, good. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's the way it should be. But also, if you have time this week, I would love to interview you. Sure. To do a podcast about your trip. Okay. We'll set that right. up. I got to go. Our podcast today brought to you by UserWay. This is a company I, uh, when I found out about them, I jumped for joy. We had this problem. Everybody does who has a website, a public facing website, which is all of them, right? The American with Disabilities Act, ADA, requires that it be accessible. When I found that out, I thought, oh, this is going to be a challenge. I thought, I don't know how to do this. It's going to cost a lot of money. And then I found UserWay, userway.org. It's amazing. Their vision is one I really connect with. Every website, without exception, has to be, should be accessible. It's just the right thing to do, but it's also the law. UserWay is an incredible AI-powered solution that tirelessly enforces the hundreds of WCAG guidelines. WCAG um, this is the accessibility guidelines developed by the World Wide Web Consortium and enforced by the ADA. You can actually be sued for not keeping your website accessible. Big companies have. It's not unusual. They should. It's just the right thing to do. Uh, very famous pizza company. You know the name. Sued uh, because their site wasn't accessible. Their defense was, well, we have a phone number. Uh, if you're blind, just call the number. U.S. Supreme Court said, no, that's separate but equal. You're a public entity. You have to have accessible website. Fortunately, UserWay makes it really easy. Their AI and machine learning solutions already power accessibility for over 1 million websites, including Coca-Cola, Disney, eBay, FedEx, many, many leading brands. And now those best-in-class enterprise tools are available to small and media business, medium businesses. I was, I was very nervous when I found out how much it cost. I was thrilled. We're going to give you an even better deal, just if you keep listening. Uh, it's a, a line of JavaScript you insert in your code, pulls in the scripts you need, automatically does things like adding alt tags to your images. That's where the AI comes in. It can recognize the image, say, oh, that's the Golden Gate Bridge, and add that alt tag. You can improve it, of course, but at least you're getting the base alt tags in there. Uh, another problem, constant problem with for screen readers, nav menus. Uh, user ways, simple AI machine learning and computer vision will remediate your complex navs. It ensures all your pop-ups are accessible. It fixes vague link violations, fixes any broken links. Make sure, here's another one. Make sure your website uses accessible colors without changing your brand standard. Every browser has uh, 
the layer that most of us are used to seeing, that front layer, but also has an accessibility layer that's invisible to uh, everybody except for screen readers and other tools made to make the site accessible. That accessibility layer can have a modified logo, for instance. They enhance the luminance and uh, the, the uh, saturation without changing the hue. So it's your brand's color. Uh, but it is more accessible. You want to make sure these are, that's a requirement, web accessible uh, colors. You'll get a detailed report of all the violations that were fixed on your website. And it doesn't matter what platform you're using. It could be WordPress, Shopify, Wix. It's easy to add user way. AEM, Sitecore, SharePoint, or your own code, frankly. It integrates seamlessly with all of them. User way will help your business meet its compliance goals and, and open up your website to the millions of users, I think it's something like 60 million users. It's kind of a remarkable number uh, who currently can't see your site. Let me just uh, bring in a voice you'll know. Hi, I'm Susan Bennett, the original voice of Siri. You won't hear me say something like this too often. I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're looking for. But every day... That's what the Internet is like for millions of people with disabilities. UserWay fixes all of that with just one line of code. And a, a line of code that's easy, simple to use, and very effective. UserWay can make any website ADA compliant and fully accessible. Everyone who visits your site can browse seamlessly, can customize it to fit their needs. It's a great way to showcase your brand's commitment to millions of people, 60 million people in the U.S. with disabilities. User, it's here. Look, I shouldn't have to convince you. This is just the right thing to do, and it's easy and it's affordable. Go to userway.org slash twit. We're going to make it more affordable. 30% off UserWay's AI-powered accessibility solution right now. 30% off. Great deal. Userway, U-S-E-R-W-A-Y dot org slash twit. Userway, making the internet accessible for everyone, as it should be. Userway.org slash twit. We thank him so much for support of the Tech Guy Show, and your support helps too. So don't forget to use that address, userway.org slash twit. Now back to the show. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I didn't want to leave. Oh, I had so much fun. Beautiful country, beautiful people. Very warm. Boy, the food was good. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888, ask Leo, going back to the phones, David from Santa Clara, California, or Santa Clarita, I'm sorry. Hi, David. Hi, Leo. Welcome. Thank you. So, um, so I've been an AOL, <laughs> yes, a blast from the past, an AOL customer uh, on email since about 1995. Yeah. And... Um, we have a Mac now. We're using the, the Mac um, OS email client. And I'm trying to figure out how to back up all of my old emails in the, you know, likely event that, uh, uh, you know, we lose data. Yeah, let's like move that. you off of AOL pronto. <laughs> AOL's been sold and bought and bought and sold. And <laughs> I don't even know who owns them these days. But, uh, right. yeah, it, it'd probably be wise to to go somewhere else i think almost everybody now seems like has a gmail account the google mail i'm st i'm not even a f quite a fan of that it's free uh you know it's ad supported but it, the, the ads are not intrusive and i you know it's very good email but i kind of like the idea of of going to a company that does email and, and paying them just because i think email is important and so i want it to be treated as more important so i don't have to run away every time they decide to change their business model uh, nevertheless, uh, how do we get our data off of AOL, our email off of AOL? Micah Sargent. <laughs> yes, this is actually quite a simple process because you mentioned that you're using the Mail app on your Mac. And the Mail app makes it very easy to export and therefore archive. Because it's downloading it as you check your mail. Exactly, yeah. every time. So it's it's a very simple process. We'll, of course, have a link for you uh, in the notes. But essentially, on your Mac, you just choose that AOL uh, account that you have. You choose File, and you choose Export Mailbox. 
and then you're good to go. Then it'll be saved wherever you want to put it. You know, if you've got Dropbox storage or iDrive storage or whatever storage uh, you use, it'll be there and you can always open it in the mail app again anytime you need to. And I actually use this a lot with, uh, with old Gmail accounts from when I've had previous jobs. I just pop open that mailbox account. I can search through the mail, find what I was looking for, close it again and put it back on the external storage that I want. So it's a pretty simple thing to do, luckily. That's because you're using a mail client. And so a mail client like Apple's Mail or uh, uh, Outlook on the PC downloads that mail, even with from an IMAP server, uh, which, which AOL is now, still downloads a copy of that mail and you can save it out. If you weren't, if you're just using the web interface to AOL or the even worse, the software interface to AOL, it's a little more manual, but you can individually save messages and you probably can select, you know, 100 messages and save them out. Um, but that's obviously not the ideal way to do it. In fact, if, that, if that's the only way you're using AOL Mail is through their client, it's probably worth getting a mail client like Apple Mail or Outlook uh, or Live Mail if you're on Windows and downloading that email and then saving it from there. Are you going to move, or yeah. David, or are you going to stay with AOL? Um, we're, uh, my wife just gave me a note. Say, so how, how easy is it to end off of and get off of AOL? Well, this it's is the hard easy. thing because it's a change of address, right? So you've everybody, sure. you know, for the last 100 years has known yeah. that your address is at AOL.com. Uh, and th this is another problem. And uh, you can solve this problem now for all time by getting a domain uh, they're cheap, about ten bucks a year. The family name, uh, your name, whatever you want. If if your wife's using it too, maybe get the family name dot com or the family name. I have actually the family name dot email, uh, which means it can go to me, my wife, my kids, whoever wants to use it. Uh, anybody with the same last name. So once you register that, then you can get an e you can have it just forward to Gmail if you want to use Gmail, or you can get email service and forward to that. The nice thing about doing that is it's being forwarded and if at some point you decide to get off gmail or get off that service you can go to another one and you, all you do is you change the forwarding so the forwarding is kind of permanent for now uh create a new email account and then start down this is another way by the way to get the aol mail if you set up a google uh, mail account a gmail account you can have it gather your email from aol into that google inbox in fact you can have it continue to do that Every day or hour, it can check and see if there's any mail. Put it in your inbox. So now you can you can maintain that AOL address, but start giving out a new Gmail address. And I'm using Gmail as an example. You could do this with almost any service. Giving out that Gmail address and eventually phase out that AOL address. Maybe put it in your signature. Hey, I don't use the AOL address anymore. Please update your contact uh, information for me to this new address. Doing it. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Doing it in Gmail is potentially problematic because 10 years from now, you're going to call me and saying, well, Google went out of business. So now what do I do? <laughs> uh, I don't think that's real likely. But, but I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, I don't think so either. But it's always a problem. That's why I don't use, I have a Gmail account. Uh, I have Laporte at Gmail, of all things. But I don't use it uh, directly. For a long time, I just I used uh, you know a, a custom domain name and forwarded it to Gmail. Now I forward it to a, a company that does email called Fastmail. It's my preferred way of doing email, uh, and they handle it. Uh, so the forwarding is nice because you can move around. If I decided tomorrow ah, I don't want to pay for Fastmail anymore, I'm going to go to Yahoo. I could just change the forwarding; and it would automatically forward there. Uh, still. You can still set up whatever. In fact, it might be easiest to do it with Gmail right now anyway, that it gathers all your email from AOL. So it's, you have one inbox that's got everything in it. Uh, and then if you want, you can create a domain name that reflects to Gmail for now. 8888-ASK-LEO. I, I say it every time. I think email is important, right? Maybe we should pay more attention to who we get it from. Don't get it from your internet service provider. You know, Google's okay. Gmail's okay. Actually, if of all the free providers, that's probably the best. But, but a lot of us think, you know, it's worth 10, 15, 20 bucks a year. It's not expensive to get an email account with a provider that just does email. I just, it's important, right? You wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't have a cell phone number that was just a free number that you got from Google. 
you take that more seriously, I think. Deborah is on the line from Laguna Beach, California. Hi, Deborah. Hi, how are you? I'm great. Welcome. What can I do for you? I just have a quick question. My uh, husband purchased an iPhone uh, or an iPad a couple years ago, about two years ago, and then he passed away about three months later. Oh, I'm so sorry. And so, so thank you. But all I, I went and asked if they would, um, they could clear it. But unlock it. Do you and have the receipt? No, you need the proof. Yeah, you have to have no, a proof I of don't. purchase. And they, they do this because they're they're worried about people stealing it. And you you have a death so he, so he bought it. Um, if you had a credit card receipt, anything that could show that he bought it, then Apple would do no, that for I, you. I th I thought even Amazon and and I went back and I couldn't you find couldn't it. Find so it. I, I'm not sure. As yeah. far as I know, there is no other way to unlock it. Apple, uh, you know, they can do it. You have to convince them. You might just keep trying. Go to the Apple store, throw yourself on the mercy of the court, call, you know, bring a box of candy. Because uh, they can do yeah. it, but they have. But you have to get them to do it. And their, right. you know, uh, whole policy is, well, if you can't prove you own it, we're not going to unlock it for you. I have an iPad some uh, employee had. Um, I can't find the receipt. We we can't unlock it. It's it's a it's a brick, and that's unfortunate. Yeah. And you don't want to save okay. the data. It's not like you're you want to see what you know what's on there. You just want to no, use I it. Even took it right. I took it to a computer company, and I said, no, they can't do it either. All day. Only Apple can do it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It's kind of a it's a weird situation, but I think Apple started doing this. They call it activation lock. Uh, if you knew your husband's Apple password, you could do it. Right, and I didn't. You don't. But, so, yeah. You... But the thing is, is like I said, the computer shop cleared it all out. It's not that I wanted to see, you know, yeah. information in there. I just wanted to be able to use it. They wiped it, but they didn't. Un uh, so it's it's an activation lock. Once he started using it, logged into his Apple account, it couldn't be uh -huh. used by anybody else until he released it. And as I said, Apple has the ability to do this as well, but you have to prove to them you bought it. They're afraid that, it, you know, they. I think this is overzealous on their part. I really wish they right. weren't so aggressive about this, but they're trying to prevent people from stealing uh, iPhones. It, it, it did. There used to be a very brisk market in stolen iPhones. This activation lock feature completely killed it because people, crooks, realized, well, I'm not going to be able to do anything with this. Uh, but unfortunately, oh, okay. people like you who have a completely legitimate desire to use this hardware that's perfectly good. Uh, I don't know how the guy wiped it without being uh, able to yeah. log in. I bet he didn't wipe it. I think he just told you he wiped it. That's how I'm feeling about that, too. Oh. And you're sure that uh, it was purchased from Amazon and not Apple or another place? It could have been Apple. I'm not even sure. I just remember when it came, he was surprised how quick it came. So I was thinking, oh, well, maybe you got it from Amazon. So I went back and there was no purchase. Apple from also Amazon. has the ability to search for previous orders. So I'm thinking that you could try going there. Uh, you go to the Apple site, you choose orders, and then you type in the information to look up uh, that information. So it could be that you could come across the invoice, the receipt that way uh, okay. if it was purchased from Apple instead of from Amazon. Okay. I'll do that. Otherwise, I just throw it away. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, that's a shame, yeah, isn't okay. it? Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. It seems like a waste. Yeah. Um, it's just, that's, you know, that's their policy. And I know of no way to get a, I, there's, as far as I know, there's no hack or anything you can do. It's just. Okay. Yeah. I just thought I would check just to make sure. <laughs> well, I, you know, I'm glad Mike is here because if Micah says it, it's true, he's an expert on, <laughs> on iOS. Okay. Sorry, Sorry Debra. Thanks, Debra. Thank you. Have Take a good care. day. You too. Bye bye. Sorry about your husband. Bye bye. More commonly, we get the question of I I want to uh, get into the phone. And I want to see the pictures or whatever. Oh. And it's the same issue. Yeah. You know, you really, if this you is... have, 
There is now a legacy feature you can you can set up your your ex uh, your, or your late husband if he had set up this legacy feature you'd be able to get into you'd have to be established as a legacy contact. It is brand new, uh, but yes, it is a feature that lets you. I have it set up with uh, my mom, uh, and so oh, that's nice. If I were to die, you know, God forbid, <laughs> then she would be able to show that she yeah. could have access to it, uh, and I try to set that up with as much as possible, you know, online accounts, etc. But I think, you know, we don't, <laughs> humans are genetically predisposed to not be constantly thinking about death. And so we don't really think about the fact that we could suddenly not have access to these things. So we really do have to make a concerted effort to set these legacy contacts up and these legacy systems up. You could actually, that's a good, somebody said, just walk into the Apple store, toss it on the Genius counter and walk away, say, because I guess they could, well, they should be something like, well, I don't I know. Thinking they don't want to encourage theft, you, I guess. You could maybe, tr if you just were done with it, you could try selling it on eBay with the clarification that this is an activation locked iPad. Maybe someone would buy it for the parts. They rather could take it just, apart. Yeah, rather yeah. than just throwing it away. That's a good point. You could take the display. Someone could use that's that display to put it on a new iPad, yeah. that kind of thing. So. yeah. You could at least make some money off of it, even if you, rather than just tossing in the trash. This is all the uh, roasted maguey, which you then have to use a machete to chop up. <laughs> this was uh, this was a traditional, not ancestral place. The, an the ancestral place we went, which we went to, was part of our Day of the Dead thing on November first. Um. The, guy, the the mezcalero, the guy who makes it, who is apparently also an architect and he designed it and everything. It's this beautiful place, ancestral uh, style um, mezcal making, and they were still making it. Like they make it like all night, I guess. Wow. But he looked just like John Lovitz in a cowboy hat, <laughs> <laughs> and he's he's going around and he's got a giant funnel. It's like this big, full of mezcal, which I guess he just got out of the still. Is he holding the bottom? He's of holding it? the bottom of his finger, and he goes over to you. <laughs> and he says, "They don't even ask; they just say mezcal." And, you, and, they, and he goes over and takes his finger up, and then pulls it up, and then he moves. <laughs> what? And I'm so sad I did not get video or a picture of this because it's John Lovitz filling up your mezcal <laughs> with a giant funnel. It's the funniest thing ever. What are these little f f fibers you're holding in your hand? There, these tiny little where. Uh, so oh, with the, uh, so they're also textiles quite famous, I think. Uh, this yes, here? yeah. So um, the uh, Oaxaca got famous because they were able to make a red dye out of these beetles, and the beetles live on the cactus uh, plants. And they, um, yeah, I can show you the um, the uh, the British bought. Oaxaca was on the map during this, you know, because the British would get their red dye for the red coats from this beetle. That's incredible. It was an inc it's an inc beautiful red, as you can see. It's just, and he was adding a little lemon to it or water. Salt, lemon, or water changes the color. But this is the beetle's ground up. You add a little water to the beetle's ground up, and then it turns into this very rich color. Very beautiful color. And uh, so this this thing we were at was a, a traditional uh, f weaving place, and they. Um, yeah, let me see if I can find this. This is my pictures mixed in with Mike and Amira's and everybody's because uh, it's a shared album. But the um, so they they actually shear the sheep, card the wool, <laughs> uh, spin the wool. Diet, all natural, with natural stuff, uh, including these beetles. And, and we bought a rug uh, there because it's just beautiful. We, we talked to the guy who, uh, who uh, wove it and everything. That's really cool. Yeah. You actually got to meet the oh, person we're, who we're, the we're, rug. we're watching them at the looms. So these are the candles. <laughs> these are the, this I is, did get to see some of those. The 84-year-old candle maker, she's on her knees all the time. Oh, yeah, here we go. Here's, uh, so these cactus petals are see the white stuff that's the beetles <gasps> so they hang them up and the beetles just grow on there 
And you get all this, and he spins it on these, you know, traditional spinning wheels. And you get, look at that red. It's incredible red. Indigo blue. Um, it all starts with the, 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 if they want to do a dark color, they'll use dark wool. If they want to do a light color, they'll use light wool. It's really kind of amazing. This is the guy who uh, wove our, uh, whoops, who wove our carpet. That's amazing. Um, he was he was really cool guy. That's his loom. Yeah, and it's a beautiful carpet. Incredible. But you will undoubtedly see. It has this beautiful green. We said, how did you, there's the carpet. How'd you get the green? He's showing us the mint. Plant? The, yeah, the plant that it gets the green dye from. I would like to make some crochet or knitted stuff with that yarn there, mate. <laughs> so, cool. so cool. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Hour three of the Tech Guy Show on the air. Leo Laporte here. I am your tech guy for this hour. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number. If you have a question, a comment, a suggestion, if there's anything you'd like to know, 8888-ASK-LEO. Micah Sargent's joining me. He is a Tech Guy Junior, helping me uh, with all of the tough questions. I give them to Micah. Micah, I don't know. How do you do that? And he he answers. He's kind of impressive. So um, that's Mike has been joining me of, uh, of a Saturday, and it's really good to have you. Thank you for good to be here. being you know. here. I think we do a better job, the two of us, than any one of us alone might do. Daniel. We've also got our brain trust in the chat room, our team tech guy at irc.twit.tv. Jim's on the line from Glendale, California, our next call. Hello, Jim. Hi, how are you? Very well. How are you? Not bad. Um, <clears throat> I called you about three weeks ago when we were talking about Apple versus uh, Android. Yes. Today, I, ha I have a... <clears throat> and we should mention, you are an avid Android fan. In fact, you said the iPhone was boring. Yes, and that opinion has not changed. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Here's what I want to ask you about. Um, yes. <clears throat> you know, I've been off of Android for about almost two years, and now I'm back on it with my S21 Ultra. I noticed that when I go to Wi-Fi settings, there are a lot. It only shows, when you want to choose a network, the strongest signals. If I go to an, a separate app, like, say, Wi-Fi uh, Analyzer, it shows how many networks are really out there. It looks like when I go to the in-phone app to connect to a network that signals that are below about 75 dBm don't show up there. But it can't be a hardware problem if I'm seeing it in other software. So they've done this either on purpose or by accident, and I just wondered why. Yeah, because it's too weak. Uh, so the weaker the signal, the slower the bandwidth up, and at some point so slow that it's unusable. So I don't know about you. I'm opening up my Pixel 6 here, and I see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10... Wi-Fi access points, but you're absolutely right. If you pick up an analyzer, which is designed to respond, you know, report any signal it can see, you'll see more than that. But I think, I would guess, Samsung is probably doing this as opposed to a Google and Android, that they're just not showing you networks that would be pointless for you to join. Uh, because well, that's, that's, that's reassuring because it's, I more or less come to the conclusion, at first I thought, uh-oh, I've got a hardware problem. But no, 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 no. I could see networks. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm, I'm reassured that it's not. But I did wonder what the logic was behind it because I, I do, and I do agree with you. I think it's Samsung because I have another Android phone here, sort of a throwaway, and it shows many, many more networks. Ah, than, interesting. So yeah, I so Sa Samsung, yeah. Samsung highly customizes Android. It, you, you know, if you ever use a, a Google Pixel, which is kind of pure Android, mm -hmm. that the whole system preferences interface is completely different and you know there's different entries and so forth so yeah i mean that's samsung's uh, prerogative it's they think they're at it and i think they're probably right adding value uh, by customizing it that would be one way they'd add value not every visible wi-fi signal is 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 usable for other reasons as well you know my direct tv ha is has a wi-fi signal that it puts out i can see it by name but if i joined it there'd be no internet there uh roku's do the same thing microwave ovens there's lots of wi-fi devices that will appear their ssids will appear in an internet scan but they may not be in fact uh joinable networks i've i've noticed the okay. same thing and and i'm i'm guessing here but i'm guessing that if you if you look at the those signals as they as they get lower and lower 75 db is really right on the edge so i could see that maybe they would say oh if it's less than 75 db let's let's not let's not bother 
Yeah, I'm not uh, complaining. Like I said at first, I'm like, uh oh, I hope no. No, I don't think it's anything wrong with your device. No, yeah. And I do think it's up to the operating system or the designers because I obviously you can see more, but it would make sense for them to say, well, look, we're not going to show them that. Okay. Uh, my last question for you is this. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, Google Assistant, uh, I use it periodically, and I always just use the voice access for it. I really would like to get rid of the swipe up from the bottom. It, I'm always doing it by accident, and... I looked online about how to do it. It appears as though I'm on Android 11. Look at the gestures. In the I, I, and Again, I'm trying to remember Samsung. I don't have my Samsung phone with me, so I'm not quite sure. But I, it, it's in the, it should be in the gestures section of the settings uh, that you can change. You can absolutely change how it responds to swipe up, swipe left, swipe right, and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can add home buttons and so forth. I'm, I can't guarantee that you could turn off the Google Assistant, but I'm pretty sure in, a, in a settings you can turn off that swipe up to get the Google Assistant for sure. Well, this is an example, though. The reason you were bored with the iPhone is because you didn't have all these choices, right? This is an example of why Android, for some people, is is uh, desirable because you have all these configuration choices. But there's some people who say, I don't. I just, I, I don't even want to deal with it. Just do it do it right the first time. Well, it's a love hate affair with me. Yeah. Uh, I'll find problems and then I'll spend all day trying to figure it out and yeah. be frustrated and get upset and then I'll figure it, figure it out and solve it and I'll be like, yes. <laughs> so I'm kind of with you. I'm kind of with, with you. I like the ability to change the setting. It adds complexity. We're geeks though, as we talked about. Uh, yeah. It adds complexity so people who don't want to be geeks. <laughs> And say I don't want I don't want that, um, but for those of us who I the fact that I can change that is fantastic, right? Um, I'm just looking at Samsung's page. Scooter X in our chat room gave me a link to a Samsung's page to see if they have they have talk about using Bixby. I'm sure you don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. No, well, I Google Assistant. I just I just want to you know yeah. say, okay Google. Yeah. I don't want to pipe up. One nice thing that Google used to do is that squeeze the bottom of the phone would uh, set off the assistant and they took that out of the Pixel 6. I thought that was a nice way to trigger the assistant. Now it's the on off uh, switch I think if you press mm -hmm. and hold that. And that seems to be phone makers even Apple seems to be the kind of settling on that as the way to ma manually trigger the assistant. Sometimes you don't want to talk to the assistant. You just want it mm -hmm. you don't want to say hey Google or you, or, you know you don't want to address it. Right. And so having a nice yeah. physical switch is a, is a good idea. Do you still have the Bixby switch on the left of your Samsung? I think they, did they get rid of that? Well there's, there are only three buttons, and they're on the right hand. Okay, they got rid of it. Oh, and there is no. Yeah, until until it must have been the S20, they had a left hand button that was just to call the Bixby assistant, which no one wanted. Remember that. <laughs> I rebacked mine right away. To yeah, Bixby. immediately. Yeah. <laughs> hey, a pleasure talking to you, Jim. <laughs> yeah, you have a good day. You Thank too. You. Take Bye -bye. care. Uh, Here's what Samsung says, why Bixby should be your default AI assistant. As amazing as Google Assistant and the other AI assistants are, Bixby's the only one, the only one that can access Samsung-exclusive services. This is so Samsung, right? Right, because we all want access to those Samsung-exclusive yeah. services. We know you want that. And don't forget Bixby's key functions. Bixby Reminders helps you stay on track of your schedule. I, it's great that we have choices. It's, we've got Siri, we've got Echo, we've got Google's Assistant, we've got Bixby, we've, we had for a while Microsoft's Cortana. I like having a variety. It would be nice to have all those choices, but it's not good to have two assistants working at the same time on any device. You should have one. I want to have a choice. I, I understand that, right? But I, but you know, it I gets just want them all off. on Samsung. That's one of the, my biggest complaint about Samsung phones is they duplicate a lot of Google functions, and including the assistant. Yeah, they don't add value. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just well, we're going to give you our version of that. It's good. So hip, Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888, ask Leo, the phone number. Let's go to Colorado Springs and say hi to Brad. He's our next caller. Hi, Brad. Hi, Leo. How are you doing? I am well. How are you? I'm doing just fine. Thanks. What's up? Well, 
Uh-oh. 10, 12 years ago, and I was able to get a discount with their on their account, um, and then their name showed up on my caller ID when I made a phone call, which was fine. But I have since left that company, uh, changed carriers two times, but their name still shows up on my caller ID when I call somebody <laughs> new. Oh, and, this is an interesting question. And nobody can tell me. And nobody can tell me how to get rid of that. I've been to the, I use a iPhone. I've you been to the Apple store. I've called my current carriers through Xfinity. Um, talked to both of those, and they can't tell me how to get that off my caller ID. Is Xfinity your current carrier? Yes. I used to be with AT and T. Yeah. Because it's that. my impression that this is a the caller ID is generated by the carrier. So you you've called Xfinity and said I want to change my caller ID and that's not working. Correct. Okay. Um. You can I know you could uh, with some phone companies T-Mobile for instance turn off the caller ID. Um. This is this is an interesting conundrum because it's it should be Xfinity that should be able to do it. That's where that information is coming from. Um, and well, you ported the you brought the number along with you, right? Each time, or correct? Yeah. Yep. So yep. that's so uh, when you ported the number from one carrier to another, you also ported the caller ID. <laughs> ID, uh, which means Xfinity owns it right now. That's that's their that's their thing. Yeah, and maybe I just haven't got to somebody at Xfinity that knows anything. But tried it twice: once on the phone with them, and once in a store. Now Xfinity ri rides on Verizon as their carrier. They're really not a carrier themselves. They're in what's called an right. MVNO. So it's right. probably the fact that the the Xfinity guy doesn't have access to the Verizon database. Right. Um, wow, this is a really interesting question. Um, I mean, you can't really call Verizon. They're going to say, well, you're not a customer. But it is, in exactly. fact, their, their database. I bet you that Xfinity is uh, using. If you had a Verizon account, you could go to My Verizon and you could change the caller id but you don't <laughs> and i bet you this is an example and this has been a problem for comcast which is xfinity forever which was they built their network through acquisitions they were a small philadelphia company that acquired uh, cable company after cable company and each one had its own computer system and and frankly, Comcast is notorious for doing a terrible job integrating these new computer systems into their old system. So if you ever talk to a Comcast uh, repair guy or a, a cust you know, somebody who's actually kind of aware of the systems, they'll tell you this is a nightmare, you know, because we're using a variety of different computer systems. And I and this is a perfect example. Your caller ID is stored on Verizon's computers. <laughs> Uh, and Xfinity probably doesn't have a good way to get to that. But because you don't have a Verizon account, neither do you. <laughs> um, you might, you know, you could call. It might. I, I think they're just going to say, well, you don't have an account with us. But you could call Verizon customer service, 800-922-0204. That's the, if you were a Verizon customer, that's the way you would get your caller ID changed. Or you could log into your My Verizon account. Uh, okay. uh, Xfinity should have this complete capability as well. Uh, and I bet you, you know, in years to come, they will. But right now, it's a fairly new service built on Verizon. I bet you they don't have an interface to the Verizon database, and they can't do it. Uh, that's okay. that's my that's my only okay. guess. Look on your Xfinity uh, phone account. See if there is somewhere that you can um, change your caller ID. Uh, yeah, I've I've tried. I've looked. You know, I've looked all through the phone, and it's not there. And uh, I've looked through the account, but I'll I, I will certainly try it again. And, uh, 
problem. Yeah. At all. Other people who've had your similar fun. problem are saying the same thing. Oh, really? That, that they can't find it either. And that every time they've talked to Xfinity, Xfinity says, sorry, we can't change it. So it really does seem to be, unfortunately, something that's not able to be changed. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm sure in time, this is what it's, has historically happened with Comcast, is eventually they absorb these systems and they figure out ways to interoperate. But it's not at all unusual uh, with Comcast for them to have multiple computer systems that don't talk to each other. And I think you found right. you found one of them. Uh, right. I guess, okay, here's what you could do if, you re if it's really driving you crazy, which it should be, because uh, you don't work for that company anymore, is you could right. do one last time. <laughs> you could port that phone number, say, to something like, uh, you know, Google's Fi or somewhere, bring the phone number along, uh, or move it to Verizon, change it with Verizon, and then move it back. <laughs> How much do you want to change this? Okay. <laughs> okay. How badly do you want to change your caller ID? Because that's what I think that might be the only way to do it. Okay. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Here's wait a minute. somebody now from the chat room has posted. Okay. Uh, Mike B has posted a, from uh, the Xfinity forums. How how did how to Outbound caller ID name change. They're all saying... They're saying you can't. can't. So there we go. <laughs> there we there go. go. Congratulations, you're our winner. Uh, well, wow. I get a, How do you I like the Xfinity price. service otherwise, though, Brad? Is it okay? Uh, it's been fine. Yeah, I, I've been on it since I called you. I'm actually driven from Colorado Springs to Denver. Oh, this now, sounds great. As I've, as I've been talking to you yeah. or holding. So. Yeah. You know, it worked the whole way. Nice. It cut me off. So. Yeah, it's Verizon, yeah. so it should be good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it works, works fine. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because this is exactly, uh, I'm looking at this uh, forum. We'll put a link in the show notes just for giggles. Uh, this is exactly what people are. The name has to be fixed somewhere on the carrier side. Uh, right. And, uh, you know, the problem is you've got a, an MVNO, which apparently doesn't have access to the Verizon database, which is, I think, where it really, really has to be changed. Sorry, right. Brad. Right. Hey, no problem. I appreciate the time. Pleasure talking to you. Take care. You too. Drive safe. 8888 Ask Leo. If you, if you know a solution, and I, uh, you probably heard me throughout the show where say, check the website or we'll put a link in the website. That is techguylabs.com. That's the uh, that's where all the show notes are. Whenever I mention a link or even just give an answer, uh, we put it up there, uh, audio and video from the show after the fact, so you can even watch or listen to your call and get the answer and all that. And that's free. There's no sign up. There's no charge. Techguylabs.com. You can also, if you have gone through this and solved it, that's another way you can help by leaving a comment at the website. Uh, I, my plan is to make, you know, there's a whole idea. We've been doing this website for years now is to make it richer and richer with more and more answers. Pretty soon I can just say, well, check the website. Te <laughs> no. TechGuyLabs.com. I'll check it for you. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More calls right after this. Are you playing this for me, Professor Laura? Mr. Big Shot, who do you think you are? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. That's who I am. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. Lex, next from Richmond, Virginia. Hello, Lex. Good afternoon, Leo. Thank you. Thanks for calling. I'm interested in whether you... I'm interested in whether you ever get nostalgic about an old phone and put it to use safely and how you do it. If so. <laughs> well, I have a little museum. I don't know. You can't really tell. But if you've watched the video ever, there's a, 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 a case behind me with all kinds of old stuff. I've got a Palm Pilot, a Trio. I've got the last BlackBerry I used. I gave it up in 2007 when I got the first iPhone. That's there, too. In fact, I've even got that old Motorola thing that you'd sling over your shoulder, you know, the big battery pack. Oh, yeah. I had one. Yeah. So but the problem is a lot of those aren't going to work anymore. Actually, it ties into a story that we've been covering, which is that the, you know, gr what happens is the phone companies gradually eliminate older technologies. So right. the earliest phones were using an analog radio technology. I don't know if you remember, but many years ago, maybe a decade ago, they finally turned those off. Those those phones won't work because they don't have the right kind of radio. Then they did GSM, CDMA. 
They did 2G and 3G. They went to LTE. Now they're moving to 5G. And gradually they roll off the older technology. So, in fact, uh, over the next year, 3G is going to be turned off in uh, by all the carriers. Uh, they're, they're not going to be supported anymore. So unless you have a modern phone, there's no way to make it work again. You'd have to take the guts out and put new radio transmitters in. How about a Samsung S8? They do oh, LTE. Yeah. No, S8 would be fine. They don't it anymore. Well, they now, so somebody it. called me a couple of weeks ago and said the same thing, that his phone company was saying, oh, these won't be supported anymore. I don't know if... <laughs> If if uh, I don't know why they're saying that, I'm not sure that's true. I, I hate to say it, but they may be just trying to get you to buy a new phone because these are LTE phones. I think there's lack of security updates now, and they're stuck on Android nine. Well, that of course, but that's a big problem in the Android world. Remember, there are literally hundreds of Android phone manufacturers, and most of them are sub fifty dollar phones sold in poorer countries. Those phones yeah. are stuck on Android 5 or 6 or 7. I mean, they're old. They never, will yeah. never get security updates, uh, but they're still in widespread use. This is why the you know the, such a large percentage of Android phones are on old versions of Android because they're made by, you know, they're cheap phones made by manufacturers who don't really care. Uh, for your S8, yeah, if Samsung says we're not going to patch it anymore, that's problematic. Okay. This has been the this is this has been the issue. In fact, Google surprised everybody by saying that they were going to continue to do security patches for the phones they just started selling the Pixel Six for five years. That's unheard of. That's unheard of. Most companies, it's two years at most. And routing opens up danger. I understand. Well, no. <laughs> routing, if you can do it, is actually a great thing to do. So you certainly can root that S8. Um, as Samsung for a while was trying to do things to prevent you from rooting it. My suggestion is go to a, a forum called XDA Developers. That's xda-developers.com. Search for your exact model, not just S8, but look in the settings. There'll be a, a larg, longer uh, identity number. Search for that, and there'll be a whole thread on how to root it, and they'll talk about the different... Once you've rooted it, that means you can put any firmware on there. It doesn't have to be from Samsung. And once you've rooted it, there are modern firmwares you could put on there that would absolutely keep that phone alive. All right, super. I may try that in a period of boredom. You know, that's exactly what I... In fact, to answer your initial question, that's what I do with older phones. You can't solve the problem of radios being out of date. That's a hardware issue. But if it's merely that they're not getting security patches, absolutely. There's some excellent Android ROMs that do all sorts of interesting things. You know, they're, they're, a lot of them are um, amateurs. So, you know, but Lineage OS is very, very well known. It's oh, been yeah. around. Yeah, that's, that's the, used to be Cyanogen, but it's, it's consistently been among the best ROMs. There are other ROMs that are more privacy focused. Um, you know, yeah, and these, some of them have the Google apps, some of them don't, depending on what you want. I think it's a great idea and it's certainly a fun thing to do. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you. That uh, gives me some direction. Yeah, look at Lineage. But XDA developers will have all the instructions. you got to follow them closely. It's a good thing to do with a phone you don't care that much about because there's always a slight risk that you'll turn it into an expensive paperweight. But other than that, uh, it's certainly a good way to learn a lot about your phone. Usually you have to connect it to a computer to get that uh, done. Well, thanks for that perspective, Leo. Yeah, it's good to talk to you, Lex. Thanks for calling. I appreciate it. Yeah, that's actually one of the... Another, I have to add this to Jim's list of reasons why iPhone's boring and uh, Android's interesting. Android, from its very beginning, has been open source. And Google's position has always been, you should be allowed to modify the firmware on your phone. Some manufacturers take steps to prevent that. Samsung is one of them. Uh, I don't know if, what the current status is, but for a while they really were sticklers about that and it is true that once you root a phone y y your security model is now broken you can install on it uh dangerous software you know so you have to be careful but it is kind of fun and uh, for a long time i kept 
um, an Android phone that had not only been rooted, which means you have full access to the phone. It gives you, you are the what they call the root users is another word for the administrative user, which means you can do anything you want with a phone, including erase files and put new firmware on there. And for a while, I kept a, a clock. I think it was called Clockwise Clockwork. Uh, software on there that would let me uh, day to day change it. And I would, <laughs> one day I'd be using Lineage, another day I'd be using Evolution and Paranoid Android and going back and forth. So that's kind of fun. But um, that's a little more geeky and certainly you wouldn't want to do that with the phone that you use in your day to day usage. 8888 Ask Leo is the phone number. Joy is on, Joy is on the line from Reno, Nevada. Hello, Joy. Hi there. How are you? I'm great. Welcome. Thank you. What can uh, Micah and I do to help? Oh, you can help. You were talking about paid email being better, and you mentioned fast mail. And I just wanted to ask you, I have Microsoft uh, Office 365, yeah, and it's a little pricey, but I wanted to know if you could tell me what you think of it. Well, uh so you don't just having Office get an email provider, but Microsoft can be your email provider. Um, that's usually done for business, just as Google has a business um, solution. Are you using Microsoft's Exchange email service? You... Well, I believe so. I got it through GoDaddy. And so it's... <laughs> no, GoDaddy's your email provider. So that let's be very clear. <laughs> so uh, the email provider is the person who runs the server, whether your email lives, the hard drive, the computer where it lives. That's GoDaddy. They are uh, using for webmail and for your software on your computer, Microsoft products. But that's just the software that accesses it. You can, in fact, use other software as well. But that's what they told you to use. But you don't have to. You could use Apple's mail or whatever. Your provider now is GoDaddy. Which is fine. I generally like to. I like the idea. I don't. I. I know. I sound kind of dogmatic on this issue. So I. I. Whatever you do is fine. I kind of like the idea of separating your email from your internet service provider or from the, your domain registrar. That's what GoDaddy does. Because yeah. <laughs> so when you go to GoDaddy and you get a domain name, you know joysexcellentemail.com, dot com, uh, they're going to say, and this is their business model. Oh. We could host that email for you, and it's kind of expensive, by the way. We could host that email for you, but you don't have to do that. You could have your email go to Gmail for free. So this is GoDaddy's upsell, and it's one of the reasons I'm not a fan. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. If you're not happy and you're spending more money than you want to... Um, that. Yeah, you don't have you. So you got the domain. I guess I take it you got a custom domain name. Yes, I do. I've had yeah. the domain. Uh, That's good. Awesome. Yeah, I've had them. So I love awesome. That. And the easiest thing when you signed up for that. And GoDaddy knows it. That's why they give you 100 pages of things, other things to buy, is to say, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll use your email. <laughs> but you don't have yeah. to. And it is expensive. It's not the best email ever. Um, so you could, but what you, but this takes some technical expertise and this is how they get you. If you know how to modify your records of your domain name, you could have it go to Gmail instead for free or anywhere else. It's just a matter of modifying what they call the DNS record. And in tech and specifically the MX record for your email, it says when you, so when you buy a domain name, all you're really paying them for, the 10 bucks a year, is the registration of that domain name and putting it in the big phone book in the sky. The reason I'm not a fan of GoDaddy is they then try to make a lot more money selling you other services, right? But, yeah. but all you really need is the domain name, and they're fine as a registrar. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Then you need to understand how the domain system works because... Your website could be on WordPress or Squarespace or Wix or anywhere else, even though do domain is registered at GoDaddy. They'd like you to think you have to use their web hosting and their email and all that stuff because that's how they make money. But I suggest it's worth separating it. If you know who you want to use for email, go like Google would be fine, Gmail would be fine. There will be a help page that will say, 
Are you a GoDaddy customer? Here's what you need to do to change your settings so that it will work with Gmail. The good news is because so many people use GoDaddy, it's the number one registrar. Every email provider in the world will have that help, will help you do that because they know there are a lot of people on GoDaddy. So if you want to save all that money, you can have that GoDaddy special email that you created, joysexcellentemail.com, but you can have it, you could get it at Gmail, not at GoDaddy. And what about a paid provider, though? Like you were saying. Well, I like fast mail. Same thing. Uh, you can, you can, ha you'll have to, you can have fast mail take over the hosting for your email. Um, you'll have to, f you'll have to go and get, you know, get some help from fast mail, but it's in their interest because you're going to pay them to have you do that. Mm -hmm. It's not in GoDaddy's interest, but you're going <laughs> to, but, but they have to let you do that. That's, that's how it works. Because I'm not, um, I had some problems with Gmail, the the free one, um, and I don't want my secure. My no, I agree with you. The other thing is, if you have a problem with Gmail, who are you going to call? If you have a problem with a paid service like Fastmail, they have support. You know, that's what I need. That's why I, yeah, I'm a little. I know I get on my soapbox about this, but if you if email is important, I think it is a good idea to to go to a company. Doesn't have to be fast mail, but to go to a company that does email. That's their business. And you'll be paying them. Won't be as much as GoDaddy. GoDaddy's business is not email. It's one of their one of their many sidelines. <laughs> so pick it fast mail's fine. Pick go to fast mail. You can call them or you can uh, they'll have support pages on and it'll explain step by step how to move it off GoDaddy. You'll still have GoDaddy as your registrar, but not as your email provider. Sounds good because 365 is uh, it's you don't need it. I don't yeah, need you it. don't need it. Hey, I gotta run. Thank you, Joy. Thank you. Have a Bye. great day. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. My Bye -bye. pleasure. It's time to dance with the Boogie Divine, aka Dick D. Bartolo, Mad Magazine's maddest writer and our favorite gizmo wizard. We call him the Giz Wiz. Hey, Dickie D. Leo, are you rested? Are you ready and raring to go? I am are tanned. I am rested. <laughs> and I gained about 20 pounds eating nothing but delicious tacos and just and tamales and, oh, man. Chocolate, by okay. the way. You know they invented chocolate. They did? Yes. A lot of the chocolate. chocolate covered taco was their invention. <laughs> yes, <laughs> actually, you, you know, one of the things if we oh, no, went, we did a cooking class. That. We did a cooking class, and uh, they said, "Okay, now it's time to go out and catch your grasshoppers." And we said, "What? Well, we have uh -oh. to, you can't make guacamole without having roasted grasshoppers on top." But the uh -oh. grasshoppers, we go. It's an herb garden, and the grasshoppers will taste like whatever herbs they're eating. So we picked the herb bed, and when you catch the little grasshoppers. They're jumpy little fellas. You put them in a bag and you bring them back and they roast them up and they're crunchy and delicious, but not chocolate covered. I guess you could. Okay. But, um, <laughs> yeah, no, anyway. I, I, don't like, I don't like to eat anything you have to chase around the table. <laughs> it's just a thing They're hoppity. Of mine. They're very hoppity. Yeah. Insect genocide. Don't worry, we'll make more. So, what okay, uh, what good. is your uh, gizmo? Uh, okay, so uh, I went to the first in person live Pepcom. Oh my gosh! Bless your since heart. January. Oh, bless your heart, 2019. Is my wow, it's been a <laughs> long time. Oh yeah. So they had one in New York. Everybody vaccinated, and you had to show your vaccination and uh, a government ID to nice. show that that vax certificate is you. Um, and it, it was very nice. They, they took a very large hall and, and had tables far apart. Everybody felt very comfortable there. Um, so to, I found We should out, explain. Pepcom is one of these little oh, uh, yes. sideshows where they, uh, companies go to show off new products every year. It's kind of a, like a mini CES. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It was very funny because uh, uh, Jeff Witt was there from Lenovo and I said, you know, I, I didn't see your booth. And he said, no, we just sponsored the bar. And he said, I'm here, I'm here to make sure it gets used. <laughs> so. Hey, that's a novel way of getting your product uh, out there. Uh, 
a- absolutely, absolutely. So uh, we did something from them a couple of years ago. Uh, Victrola, the people who manufacture Victrola. Now actually, wait a minute. The, is it the same these, people? It's not the same. They people. sold the it's name. It's the same. Right? They sold the name. Yeah. Exactly. It's exactly. probably some Chinese but, company. They call no, themselves. it's uh, no. I think it's no. a couple of guys here in, in the states. Oh, neat. Maybe it's built overseas, um, but they were showing the Victrola. They're a new thing they introduced at Pepcom. The Victrola Revolution Go. Yes, the first turntable and speaker system you can take anywhere because it has its own built-in lithium battery that can play up to 12 hours of your favorite vinyl records. So so bring it in the car. Listen to records as you go. No, no. not exactly. Okay. Not exactly. By the I way, that's by the way, I don't know if you knew this. I'm sure you did. That's where the name Motorola comes from. It was a Victrola for your car. Oh my gosh. No, I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. I did not know. And they actually had little record players, believe it or not. (laughs) Not a great idea, but no, no. You bring in your car. Yeah. And, and there was a little leaflet, and it said, these are the three highways where there is one mile of totally flat road where you can play your where you can play your record. Mostly the idea is you play it when you're stopped. But anyway, yes. 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 Yeah. Oh, okay. So this is a clever idea. I said to the guy, well, obviously when you're carrying it, you can't play it. I said, but can you use the speaker system? And he said, oh, yes. That's, he said, that's very keen that you thought of that. And, so, and what I like about it, it has Bluetooth both ways. So when you're just carrying it to a camping site or you're going uh, to uh, the park and you're going to play some records there, you can, on the way there, you can Bluetooth, uh, send uh, music from your phone into the speaker system. Use it as traditional Bluetooth speakers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, if you're at home and you have a great system at home, you can use Bluetooth out. Oh, that's clever. And then play the vinyl on this system. So it can either be the source it. of the music or the receiver of the music. It can go both that ways. That is correct. Wow. That is correct. Wow. And it has an Audio-Technica uh, belt-driven uh, turntable and the last units they were using uh, is it Klippich speakers? Klipsch. Klipsch, Klipsch speakers. It's a very nice Not German sure they... it's a German company <laughs> it's a Klipsch speakers. Uh, it could, it yeah. could be because the speakers sounded really great. Oh yeah great. Klipsch is good it, uh, yeah. Yeah, the guy said, yeah. well, we'll go over here in the corner here and I'll let you play it as well. Nice. Uh, the, the people will let me. Um, it's just going on sale now. Uh, reasonable, I How thought. How much? $199. You know, the kids, the young people these days, they're back into records, which is so weird. It is weird. It, 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 it is weird. It was like years ago when, when the guy was showing the, uh, I, I forgot, oh, Fuji was making the instant picture camera. Yeah. I said, in this day and age, who's going to buy this? And he said, the kids. The kids. They don't know that there was Polaroid. <laughs> Everything <laughs> old is new again yes, with exactly. the kids. Yes. Exactly. And exactly. they want to play records. There's record. There's actually, a, there's no, you could not buy, to save your life, a CD in, in this small town of Petaluma. But there are two, count them, two vinyl record stores of all things. Yeah. I don't know. It's weird. I know, and, and he said that record sales increased in the past couple of years a lot. Oh, yeah, faster so. than CD sales. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, so that's the newest, the Victrola Revolution <laughs> Go. You are, who, who, okay, everybody, get your turntables here, gizwiz.biz. <laughs> get your records. Get, get your, your hot, mate, what, Leo. Yes. The first podcast on vinyl. Oh, we should release vinyl versions of oh our podcast. Oh, my gosh. Oh, that my gosh. That would be very gosh. hipster. That's wow. actually an interesting idea. The Twit Holiday Special on vinyl. On vinyl. Yes, there the you go. Just, just do one of them. <laughs> just one of them. Uh, if you wanna, if you wanna find out more about the Victrola, um, oh, it's cute too. Oh, it you is. can carry it over your shoulder. Now That's I have really to have cute. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Darn yeah. it. The Revolution Go. <laughs> Go to gizwiz.biz. That's Dick's website. G i z w i z dot b i z, and then click the button that says the Gizwiz visits the tech guy, and you can see for yourself, uh, learn all about it. He even got has a link. Uh, to Amazon, which helps uh, Dick because he's an Amazon associate. So all the things he's ever mentioned on the show are oh, there. Oh, and the, and the new 
What the heck is it? Oh, there's a brand new one. So click the What the Heck Is It button. This is a chance to win an autographed copy of Mad Magazine. Um, okay, I have no I, 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 I will, no idea what that is, and I don't even oh, want to guess. Good. Okay, what was, okay. though, I'm curious, um, last, okay. last month? Leave, leave, it was the tube grip. The Valco tube grip. To, right. It is a way to get every last drop out of probably not toothpaste tubes, but if you're using uh, any kind of caulking, or anything that comes <laughs> in, a, it, in a tube. It's basically this big lever that squeezes yes. the last drop out of any tube. Why not toothpaste? That is well, it just is. I don't, I don't think you want this in your bathroom because it's pretty heavy duty. <laughs> Plus, I it's mean, twenty five bucks to get three yes, cents worth of toothpaste. <laughs> exactly. So, exactly. wow, it's basically but pliers you, for tubes. That's it. The tube grip. The tube grip from Valco, Cincinnati. Tube grips since nineteen fifty two. I all was right. wondering who was making them all those years. <laughs> uh, okay, so the new one is even sillier looking. I have actually an idea. I don't want to say it out loud because I think I'm right. But yeah, uh, yes, I okay. have an idea. Uh, you know, is. I'll give I'll give you is a hint. Okay, play for the funny. Send in funny. Answers Go for the funny. Course. The other one was too hard. No one got it. This one is too easy. Everybody's getting it, so, so put in stupid answers. Go for the silly one. Thank you, Dickie D. We'll see you next week. Gizwiz.biz. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. -T. It stands for This Week at Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security on Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.